Graduate Student Research Conference. Again, for student representatives of the second, uh, second portion of our program, please inform our uh, technical support back end to make you co-host so that you can have screen sharing options. We will begin at 1.30. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon once again. Welcome back to the second half of the third Sociology and Anthropology Undergraduate Student Research Conference entitled Identities, Institutions, and Inequalities. For the second half of our presentations today, we will be listening uh, from two panel presentations. Third panel would be on engagement practices and maneuverings of the youth. There will be three presenters, three groups of presenters under this panel. And the fourth panel would be on stories of subalternity sub spaces of empowerment. You will have two uh, groups presenting under that panel as well. All right. For our first presenter under the third panel, uh, Paolo Miguel Gabriel will be presenting his work entitled Watch Yesterday, Say Today, Childhood Media Consumption and the English and Filipino Language Preferences of Sophomore Ateneo College Students. We would like to acknowledge the presence of uh, Paula's thesis supervisor, Dr. Andrea Soko, Soko Roda, and members of the reviewing panel include Dr. Enrique Nino Leviste, Dr. Glenda Wee, and Ms. Jessica Sandra Claudio. I turn over the floor to Paolo to start his presentation.
Hello, mic test. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone ate a good lunch. Um, today, I'll be presenting my thesis entitled Watch Yesterday, Say Today, Childhood Media Consumption and the English and Filipino Language Preferences of Sophomore Ateneo College Students. So this will be a brief overview of what I'll be discussing for today. And starting with the introduction, um, Initial interest for the study began with the Konya label and its unique Taglish code switching. And this led to discourses about differing and sometimes conflicting opinions on English and Filipino. And there's also an interest in how these conflicting language preferences are formed and reconciled. So the study focuses on how media relates to these language preferences. The study would like to answer two research questions, particularly what is the relationship between students' childhood media consumption and their language preferences. And with that, what is the significance of media in relation to these language preferences? My study would also like to contribute to three particular things. Um, first is the theories of language preference, particularly Burdu's theory of cultural capital, and also Lichtenstein and Slavic's theory of preference construction. It also hopes to contribute to discussions about Filipino and English languages. Um, particularly on how there's differing um, and sometimes conflicting opinions about both and how to balance both, as well as contributing um, empirical data for uh, these topics. And lastly, uh, my study also hopes to contribute to media socialization as media is a part of Filipino culture and how media socialization contributes to the formation of language preferences. As for the literature review, um, we start with the social domains and how language preferences can actually change depending on the social domains, for example, the family or at school. Um, it also discusses theories of preference construction and how um, many different factors and elements can actually impact the language preference of, of a person. Next would be Burdu's cultural capital and how language preferences are a part of one's cultural capital. And this is reflected in three states, particularly the objectified, embodied, and institutionalized state. So these three will become the indicators for language preferences. Uh, moving on to how language is socialized. So we can see that language acquisition and established preferences are both uh, happen uh, during childhood. And during childhood, uh, the external environment becomes a vital aspect of that part of development. So Part of that uh, environment is the agents of socialization. So this includes the family, peers, school, religion. And the focus here would be on media. And that is because media is a part of Filipino culture and is widely present in a child's environment. So here are a few examples of popular forms of media for children. And it's also important to understand media socialization. Um, so here are the three aspects of uh, language development in relation to media socialization. So the first will be the conceptual factor, which relates to media consumption based on interests and content. The next would be the cognitive factor or the frequency of uh, media consumption. And the third would be is the social factor or the presence of social groups. So all three of these uh, aspects will become indicators for media consumption. Now, as for the conceptual framework, the independent variable will be childhood media consumption, and the dependent variable will be current language preferences of the sophomore students. So as I mentioned briefly already, the indicators for media consumption will be Johnston's three aspects of uh, language development in relation to media consumption. So this is the conceptual or the form of media and the language present in them, uh, the cognitive or the frequency of media consumption on days that they do consume it, and the social or the presence of social groups during consumption. Indicators for language preferences will also be based on Burdu's three forms of cultural capital. So the first would be the embodied or how they use their languages and how they perceive languages. The objectified refers to the language present in their media consumption. And the institutionalized will refer to the grades that they achieved in their language classes here in Ateneo. Now, I hypothesize that the childhood media consumption would affect the language preferences due to the dynamic relationship um, present within the process of social socialization. Additionally, um, it's also possible that 
that childhood media consumption does not have any significant relationship at all with their language preferences. Now, moving on to the methodology. Um, the sampling method used was uh, participants were gathered using a quota and linear snowball sampling to reach 30 participants. And the sampling frame was acquired from the university's registrar's office. Um, and also through recommendations from sophomore friends and acquaintances. The survey questionnaire was performed on Google Forms and it includes common demographic background questions, uh, indicators for media consumption, the indicators for language preferences. And this was pilot tested to ensure more accurate uh, measurements. And there's also a raffle that was included to encourage a better response rate. As for the method of analysis, uh, the data was analyzed using non-parametric measures of association. And this is because of the non-probability sampling method that was used. So here are a few examples of what the tests were. And as well as the indicators for the objectified, embodied, and institutionalized state were each cross-tabulated and tested with indicators for the conceptual, cognitive, and social aspects. As for the scope and limitations, here we can see that, again, the focus was on only on sophomore Ateneo students. And additionally, the sample group does not necessarily represent the sophomore population. Um, uh, next would be language preferences. So this study will only be looking at English and Tagalog due to its wide presence in media. And lastly, the susceptibility of the variables. So due to the reconstructive nature of the survey, it may lead to inaccurate information and preferences are also susceptible to how questions and options are framed and interpreted by the participant. So here are the following results. So here we can see that the group is largely homogenous and this also reflects their economic, social and cultural capital as students of Ateneo. Now for the cross tabulation, um, the objectified, the indicator for the objectified state was tested with the three aspects of childhood media consumption. And here we can see that no strong significance was seen because the p-values were above 5%, which supports the null hypothesis that there's no relationship between the indicators. And that the surprising thing is the only except, exception here was between the media that they consume uh, in Netflix and the media that they consume uh, cinema movies in the ages of seven years old and below. So here's a few tables to uh, showcase the data. Moving on to the embodied state and the conceptual aspect. So the embodied state is indicated by two things. They're the language that they speak with other social groups. So this was tested again with the three aspects. Um, starting with the conceptual here, we can see that only four out of the 24 results showed significance. So with that being said, there's no relationship that's seen between these two indicators. Um, the same could be said with the embodied state and the cognitive aspect because only two out of the 78 results here showed uh, a significance. So it also further supports that the cognitive aspect does not necessarily relate to the language that they speak with other people. Moving on to the embodied state and the social aspect, here we can see a uh, change wherein there was significant scene between the social groups of siblings and helpers. And surprisingly, there's no association found with the social group of parents, despite the literature emphasizing the importance of parents in their childhood media consumption. So this could also indicate that the role of media could become a space for social socialization between the participants and their siblings and helpers. Moving on to the conceptual aspect here, we can see that their language perceptions are also very strongly associated with the conceptual. Um, we can see that 14 out of the 16 results indicates an association which and that is because of the large and medium effect sizes that is seen in the tests. So this also implies a strong relationship between these two indicators. Moving on to the language perceptions and their cognitive aspect here, there's also a strong uh, association because all of the tests were above 0 0.14, which indicates a large effect size. So this is contrary to the previous set of results because this is the only time that cognitive aspect does have a strong relationship with language uh, preferences, particularly in their perceptions. Mm -hmm. Lastly, in the social aspect here, only three tests show the small effect size. So that means that the uh, relationship between these two are also very strong. So that said, all three aspects of media consumption have a strong relationship with their language perceptions. 
in particular. And lastly, the institutionalized state was also compared with, their, uh, with the three aspects. And here, almost all the results showed no significance. So that means that um, their childhood media consumption is not reflected in their grades that they received here in Ateneo. As for the discussion and analysis, here we can see that in the conceptual aspect of childhood media consumption, uh, for the most part, no relationship was found between most of the indicators for language preferences with a few exceptions. And this indicates that the, um, that the content that they watched um, before during childhood isn't necessarily relevant or important in their current environment, and that is why it's not reflected in their language preferences today as well. The same could be said about the cognitive aspect because almost all of the results also showed little to no um, relationship with their language preferences. And this could be because of the um, time difference between the time that they consumed language preference, uh, that they consumed media, and the time that they, uh, and to their language preferences now. So moving to the social aspect here, this is the only one that showed um, a significance with the embodied state, particularly with their siblings and helpers and the language that they use with them. So in that case, we can see how um, media socialization could occur between two particular groups. And this is reflected in the languages that they speak with each other. Now for the notable um, exception was in their language perceptions, wherein all three aspects of childhood media consumption uh, show the strong um, relationship with their language perceptions. And this indicates that media can change and uh, can have long lasting effects on uh, the participants' perceptions of both English and Tagalog. So to conclude, the results here differed from what was initially hypothesized because not all of the results could necessarily be explained by the literature since the results were either very specific and vary depending on multiple factors, such as the type of media, the type of language, the type of social group that they spoke to, and others. With that being said, the relationship between childhood media consumption and language preferences is very contextual. And particularly in the context of language perceptions, here we can see that childhood media does have a relationship and is only significant particularly with the socialization of their language perceptions. So here are a few recommendations for my uh, future studies, and that is to conduct a probability sampling method on more specific groups, so perhaps um, call center agents, as well as to focus on more specific forms of language preferences, um, perhaps only focusing on English or focusing only on code switching, and also focusing on a particular form of media, such as Netflix or YouTube. So here are the references, and thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Paolo, for your presentation. Again, we would like to acknowledge the presence of Paolo's advisor, Dr. Andy Socoroda, with us today. Also, uh, one of his reviewers, Dr. Enrique Nino Leviste, is also with us this afternoon on site. Dr. Glenda Wee and Ms. Jesse, uh, Jesse Claudio is also with us on Zoom. Yeah. Anyone would like to begin? Uh, in terms of the reviews. Sige po. Sino muna? Okay, ako na lang. I can start. Okay. Dr. V yeah. first. Thank you. Yeah. So, Paolo, first of all, congratulations uh, for your um, thesis manuscript. It was uh, very well written and also the analysis was uh, very thorough. So congratulations to you and Dr. Roda uh, for completing such a, such, such a good um, manuscript. Uh, can, can you hear me very clearly? Is it out? Yeah, but I have um, some few comments and questions to ask um, during your defense. There's five points, actually, just five bullet points. Um, I was thinking like um, if there could be better presentation of the connection between your theoretical framing um, especially that of uh, Bordeaux and the study results. Um, actually, in your manuscript, 
you discuss it with connection. But you know, sometimes I get lost in the discussion. So um, if it's all right, like I would suggest if you could create some sort of a table or a figure to show the connection between, uh, for example, Bordeaux's uh, framing and your findings. Uh, for example, you can lay out um, the definitions of um, embodied state, objectified state, institutional states. How are these defined uh, in the context of your language and study use? That could be one column in your figure or in your table. And for each state, uh, what did you find out in your research with regard to the language use? So there could be better um, representation of the connections between theoretical framing and what you found out in your research. So you answer this of this somewhere, but um, sometimes I've said I get lost um, in the discussion. So you can show better the connection in the table or figure so that the reader can see uh, more clearly how these uh, connections are in your manuscript. And for my second um, comment, so you provided very good exhaustive uh, literature review but maybe I suggest like at the end of the section, if you could provide a summary of the literature review and then pinpoint the contribution of your study to the existing literature. So I, I was looking for this, how all these um, literature that you exhaustively come together and then maybe pinpoint what are you saying something new in your research that would contribute to the existing literature. So, um, regarding the hypothesis in your manuscript, so maybe I suggest if you can state your study and hypothesis in simple sentence forms, because as of now they're in paragraphs, they're a bit long. So if you look at those self-published um, studies in, in academic journals, you know hypotheses are rather short and they are numbered. You know, so provide them number, you number them, and this will provide um, a better guide to the reader as well. And I also um, already raised um, this to you during your proposal defense. I was also looking at the practical implications of your research. So why is it important to study media consumption and language preferences? So I, I was looking for this in my manuscript and it didn't come out very clearly. You know, why is it very important? What's the use of studying media consumption and the language preferences? How does this um, impact, for example, in our educational system or policies that are in place um, with regard to language use okay? and education? Because that's my that, that's my area of interest. And for your presentation today, if if there's time, because I don't know if you're going to answer after me or maybe after all the three of us have given our comments. Um, how would you answer the research questions that you post in your research? So you mentioned two. So what is the relationship between students' childhood media consumption and their language preferences? And then secondly, what is the significance of the media in relation to these language preferences? So if I were to ask you, like, how are you going to answer these two uh, main research questions that you post in your thesis? But maybe you can take notes first and let's ask uh, Dr. Luisque and Ms. Claudia to give their comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Luisque. Ms. Jessie or Dr. Luisque, you may proceed. Ako ba muna, Sir Nino? Okay, sige po. So, ayun, I agree with most of um, what Doc Lenda mentioned. Ano. Actually, sila din, yun din yung mga nakanote uh, sa akin in your manuscript. No? Um, so, maybe I can start with some suggestions before the questions. No? So, as I've mentioned in your thesis proposal defense, no, yung topic mo is actually interesting, but as you also mentioned in your manuscript, the scope is also very wide, so very large siya. Um, so evident siya dun sa presentation mo and also in your manuscript. Um, so you gave us a parang a full-blown thesis manuscript, but the 
course requires uh, a journal article format, so you might have to be more concise in some parts of your discussions, lalo na sa findings mo, um, which is not easy as it seems kasi you're doing statistics or quantitative um, sociology. You know? um, so meron akong uh, some suggestions in your manuscript, which I will um, also give you a copy of um, that you might want to consider. Um, in terms of the manuscript, um, kailangan siyang i-restructure ng konti. So uh, there's a brief section on the overview of findings before the RRL. So medyo hindi nagpo-flow yung thought nung, uh, nung manuscript mo. So the RRL should be before the, the findings. Um, and there's also a, a separate discussion of the findings, yung statistical runs mo, and your theoretical discussions. But in, in my opinion, um, they... they they seem like they're saying the same thing. So, para siyang nagre-repeat. Um, so, you might want to consider marrying these two sections. So, meron ka, yung, so yung discussion mo of the findings um, already has your theoretical discussions as well. And it might make your um, discussion more thorough, more nuanced, um, na, na, na smooth siya na, na, na discussion. No? Um, at the same time, yung, what you mentioned in your finding section is also repeated in your conclusion. So your conclusion, like what Dr. Glenda said, has to tie in with your theoretical or conceptual framework in Abordu and Lichtenstein, um, etc. that you use for the study. Um, and then maybe last two suggestions in your presentation of the data. Also like what Dr. Glenda said, um, important yung summaries. So I recommend that you use, um, either you visualize the data using the appropriate graphs um, or... Um, create summary tables instead of putting um, actual SPSS results. No? So yung mga <clears throat> sorry yung mga extensive tables that you <clears throat> that you um, included in the write up, you can move them to the appendices no? and refer to them in your uh, write up. No? So una halimbawa you can have a summary table of your um, respondents. No? So even if it's in the write up, no, that something percent is from School of Social Sciences. Blank percent is from SOSE, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You might want to create a um, summary table that um, summarizes kung sino yung um, respondents mo. So, um, isip ka nung relevant na um, variables, social demographic var uh, variables that you can use uh, to, to for that um, summary table. No? Um, so, alimbawa, you might like yung yung lagay mo yung school, lagay mo yung maybe gender nung uh, the gender distribution of your respondents, um, age, kung meron kang data, whatever is relevant in your um, in your uh, study. No? And then, um, yun nga, dahil medyo marami kang, medyo complex yung, um, yung, yung kunwari, the three aspects of um, childhood media consumption versus the three states of um, language preferences. So you might want uh, to also create a summary table na mag magsasummarize nung findings mo. So halimbawa, yung pagka-present mo ngayon nung findings mo. So between um, halimbawa, embodied state and um, the, concept, uh, the conceptual aspect. Diba? May association ba siya? Ano yung strength of association? Diba? So you're thinking, uh, yung summary table, general term siya, you're using the concepts, pero you can also note wa, um, what indicators of your concepts are um, parang particularly uh, strongly associated. So merong mga, uh, meron kang mga findings kasi na parang um, halimbawa, four out of the 24 tests are strongly associated for this particular pairing of, of the concepts. No? So you might want to put that in your summary table as well. Um, so yon and also Yun nga, tulad din ang sabi ni Doc Glenda, you might want to present your null and alternative hypothesis. Lalo na, kahit yung general lang. No? Kunwari, um, there is a relationship between the embodied state and conceptual um, conceptual aspect of um, childhood media consumption. And then what is the result no? based on your on the statistical tests? No? So I suggest uh, prioritizing then what um, findings or results you might want to put in. Kasi maraming... Marami kang findings na hindi associated that I think take up a lot of airtime in your uh, manuscript. No? So my advice is to prioritize and then maybe dun sa summary table nakalagay yung mga hindi associated. But in the write-up itself, 
focus on what is um, associated, no? what is the interesting finding. No? And then further emphasize kung ano man yung context-specific um, point mo in your analysis. Okay? And then, sorry Sir Nino, medyo may konti pa kong points. Um, and then you might want to also revisit some stat tests that you use in your um, analysis. So meron kang isang ginawan ng Spearman's row, pero hindi rank yung encoding ng variable mo. So you might want to use gamma instead of Spearman's row. And then consider also the use of, um, parang for the lack of better term, in indices, index. Now I know that a lot of your variables are nominal, ordinal, pero yung, um, yung thought no, of, um, of putting them all together in one, variable so that you can run that variable against another variable. Parang instead of having 78 runs, halimbawa, or 24 runs, you only have one or two runs. No? So baka pwede mong i-reconsider yun no? if, if time permits. No? And then maybe yung questions ko, um, so as, um, as seen in your presentation, important yung sampling, but also challenging, especially that we are in the pandemic context and we can only do data gathering online. No? So that posed challenges to your research. So although I might have an idea, how might your um, resorting into non-probability sampling affect the overall results of the study? So yun nga ang dami mong non-associated um, indicators. No? So paano, parang instead of um, taking that as data in itself, no? paano kaya naka-influence yung non-probability sampling na ginamit mo dun sa nakuha mong data? No, kapag ba gumamit ka ng probability sampling or a higher, um, or an appropriately sized um, sample, more than 30 sample halimbawa, do you think the, the results would, would change and be more aligned with the literature or not? And then also seconding yung question, Doc Lenda, about the significance of the study. So you can you give parang specific points as you how as how you want to in, or how you intend um, to contribute to the discourse of um, the link between media exposure and language preference. Kasi nilagay mo that you aim to contribute to the discourse. Pero you also mentioned that there are competing um, schools of thought on the topic. So paano specifically mo ini-intend na maka-contribute. So parang do you do you uh, plan on parang aligning your study with a certain um, school of thought or do you aim to like, take um, aspects of all schools of thought in your study? And then last kong question would be, do you have any program or policy recommendations based on the results of your study? Kasi as of now, um, yung recommendations mo are parang for further studies, which are also based on the limitations that you encountered for your studies. So I wonder if there are parang applied or practical recommendations that you can make um, based on the, on the findings that you had. So yun lang po on my end, um, passing it on to Sir Nino. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. V. Thank you, Ms. Claudio. No? Um, yung sa akin, my question has something to do with the conceptualization of cultural capital, which is, I think, uh, an important uh, aspect of the study. No? Um, I wish to start with yung nature of cultural capital as reflected or as can be gleaned from your findings, Paolo. No? Um, based on those findings, no, and this is just probably a preliminary conversation that we're having, what do these findings tell us about the nature of cultural capital as far as you're concerned? Can, can, can you share? No? Pwede mo ba kaming kwentuhan kahit pa paano nung nakita mong insights, nakuha mong insights from that, uh, um, from that so, activity? Hello? Okay. Uh, based on the results, um, since... Um, again, it was very contextual and not all of the results showed significance, but some particular ones did. So this indicates that um, there are definitely some um, very specific forms of uh, media socialization that contributes to their um, cultural capital uh, and in particular in language preferences. But on the other hand, there are also many other agents of socialization that contribute to this and probably overpower uh, what media socializes. 
And that is why it's not reflected or, or seen in their current language preferences as well. Okay, thank you, Paolo. So contextual, no, being yes. being probably um, the reality that creates a more nuanced appreciation of cultural capital. As a follow-up question to that, no, um, since in the Burdushan sense, kapag sinabi natin cultural capital, we're also looking at distinctions. We're also looking at asymmetries. And so I was wondering if you were able to get an appreciation or a sense of these distinctions, how cultural capital creates and you know, legitimizes these distinctions between or across the social groups that you saw. Um, so for distinctions, actually, um, looking at the results for their language preferences, surprisingly, um, most of the students uh, prefer um, uh, one language over the other, depending on um, certain contexts. So um, in this case, that we can see a distinction there, um, not particularly with groups, but between um, domains. So, um, so for example, um, my findings uh, showed that in most uh, casual forms of language, uh, they pre would prefer uh, Tagalog. But in more formal settings, they would prefer English as the mode of language. So we can see here the two distinctions, but um, not necessarily with the group because they all share very similar preferences. Okay, thank you, Paolo. No, um, the reason I ask is probably uh, if there is still space for this, and I will leave this to Dr. Sokoroda and your prudential judgment, of course, no. Um, it might help, no? It, you might find it helpful to uh, provide a section or a subsection that shows how cultural capital, and by, by, by distinction, we not only refer to differences within the groups, but we're also talking about how cultural capital stratifies or ranks you know, these groups. In other words, cultural capital is a marker of let's say, social disparities. May nakakataas, may nasa baba lang. So do we get a sense of that no? from, the, from language preferences or the data that you, you got? No? Um, makikita ba natin yon yung, yung distinctions na yon. And I think uh, the second point and my final point really is there must be a need, and I think uh, Dr. We already pointed this out, there might be a need to go back to the theoretical and conceptual underpinnings of your, your manuscript. No? The data is relatively robust. That's commendable. That's a good problem to have. No? It's just a matter of sharpening and organizing them further. But ultimately, what do these data mean conceptually and theoretically? So magandang balikan yung mga key concepts mo to, to sharpen, to tie everything together. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, comments and questions. Okay. Thank you so much uh, for your comments, Dr. Sui. Um, as of right now, for uh, recommendations for possible policies, um, I can't uh, really uh, uh, recommend one right now since, again, as uh, Dr. Levista said, um, more um, the conceptual framework needs to be more uh, uh, connected with the data. So with that, um, after doing that, I think I'll be able to give more, a more proper recommendation based on that. So thank you. All right. Thank you so much, uh, reviewers. And thank you so much, Paolo, for your response to our reviewers as well. Congratulations in your presentation. And thank you so much to our reviewers for your generosity. Thank you so much. And we now move on to the second the presenter for the third panel. Sorry.
Hello po, good afternoon. Um, is the screen showing na po ba? Ayan, sorry. All right. For our third presenter, we sorry, second presenter for the third panel, we will be joined by Angela Marie Encomienda and John Matthew Reyes, who will be presenting their work entitled Salin Lahi, Indigenous Youth Governance and the Agta Dumagat Under a Precarious Pandemic. Their thesis supervisor, Professor Mary Raceles, is joining us via Zoom as well. And their reviewers are Dr. Enino, uh, sorry, Enrique Enino Leviste. <laughs> And Ms. Nota Magna, who is joining us by us. <laughs> Take it away. Magandang araw po si lahat. Kami po ulit si na Ange Encomienda at Matthew Reyes. And we are the principal investigators of Salin Lahi, asserting the role of Agtadumagat Youth in Indigenous Governance, which we are doing in partnership with the Save Share Madre Youth Volunteer Organization, or SSMYBO, and under the supervision of Professor Mary Reselis. So our discussion today is divided into six parts. Background, research questions, lit review, methodology, discussion, and conclusion. We'll begin with the background. So Agtadumagat leadership and political organization is informal and dynamic, interwoven into their kinship system, subsistence practices, and their material culture. They traditionally depend on their elders for the governance of their residential groups, for their livelihoods, and for the objects, knowledge systems, and the practices that embody their culture. However, their encounters with the colonial and the modern state prompted the subjugation of these indigenous leadership structures under state integration, which has prompted them to carry out strategies of resistance and accommodation in their engagement with lowlanders or mga tagapatag. The participation of Agtadamagat to Magat youth has been noted in these strategies, particularly in dealing with the social and environmental threats posed by the Kaliwa Dam. This is through SSMYVO, which despite being a civil society group, creates a platform for them to be recognized as leaders inside and outside their communities, and thus assert their role in governance. However, there's still limited documentation of the role of the youth in indigenous governance, particularly the ways in which they define it and the ways that they assert themselves in the indigenous governance mechanisms in order to embed their presence in Agtadumagat leadership and political organization. As such, this study interrogates how Agtadumagat youth define governance through youth leadership, and second, what identity assertions of the Agtadumagat youth are present in the ways in which they redefine and define Agtadumagat governance. So here is our literature review covering what has been discussed concerning Indigenous youth or Agtadumagat specifically. So in terms of the government as an interfacing concept within Agtadumagat leadership, we first begin with the idea that the characteristics of a pre-colonial Agtadumagat leadership for their semi-nomadic patterns and their habit to limit their resource use within their vicinity, we recognize that the elders are automatically deemed as the most powerful and presided in times of conflict, and leaders came second in power in terms of supervising day-to-day -day activities such as foraging and whatnot. Beyond these functions, however, every Agta Dumagat acted in a community of peers. So in terms of interfacing, what we pertain to this is the imposition of other government or the imposition of the concept of government as an umbrella term and practice that homogenizes leadership under the observation and the surveillance of state legibility. So for example, two threads expose this claim. First is the Regalian Doctrine, which has existed since the Spanish colonial regime, which initiated essential contradictions of the modern state to the conception of indigenous peoples regarding land tenure. At the same time, in the current democratic context, the existence of Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act and its mandate to create the National Commission for Indigenous Peoples, while helpful in terms of asserting Indigenous rights within the mainstream society, could also embody a form of governance that superimposes an alien political structure upon local contexts such as experienced by Agtas and Dumagats in the Philippines. So in this case, it's also important to discuss the dual responses involving the development and social change of Agta Dumagat. So in this case, development aggression 
is a persisting concept which has been posing grave consequences on their rights and natural resources, specifically on their capacity to countervail these aggressions on, on different levels. So for Acta do Magal, there is a modernization as a mark or as a mask for aggression. And in turn, they were able to also consolidate and, doc and scholarship was able to document the emergence of NGOs and church-based organizations and in inspiring indigenous groups to develop own civil society groups tied towards traditional tied, tied towards traditional leadership and at the same time anchored towards shared notions of positive social change. So connected to this is the claim that there is also an imperative of environmentalism in asserting the rights of indigenous people. So plural interpretations have existed, such as theories advancing its complementarity with the traditional ecological knowledge. And at the same time, other theories have also posited the value of including indigenous voices and highlighting bottom-up conceptions of development, such as Natasha Chasanye's Buen Vivir. So in this case, why these insects matter? It's because the current experiences of deforestation and land conversion are current amplifiers with how Agta do Magat experienced climate change. Specifically, and in the context of their role as environmental defenders, the severance of environmental ties caused by exploitative industries cause indigenous elders to form their angered resistance to assert their role in environmentalism and in protection of their ancestral lands. Concerning this is the, the involvement of youth as a form of creative expression. While it's also widely recognized and documented that the youth are partaking in environmental activism, there are ways that we need to recognize that the youth must have in terms of delving on topics concerning threats of territorial and cultural encroachment. Within Filipino anthropology, the idea of pahikisangkot is also mechanized to explore the possibilities of knowledge production in bringing about social change. So in relation to this study, the reason why we opted for the knowledge management as a co-creative practice, it's because it, it allows and it does not prevent the agency and the well-being of indigenous peoples in terms of undertaking interpretive and, appro and participatory approaches to seek means that best fit their development anchored to their traditions and idea of cultural survival. So in this case, regardless of the familiarity of Agta Dumagat youth vis-a-vis -vis governance and their experiences of their indigenous leadership, what matters is that the local conceptions that they provide was allow us to have an idea of how indigenous peoples, specifically the youth, position themselves concerning this knowledge and at the same time, how they assert their position within voices in rights assertion and, and, and ancestral land claims. For our theoretical framework, this study's overarching concept is that of indigenous governance, which is defined by Buendia and Associates as the scope of governance practiced by indigenous peoples to determine their own development, the internal management of their own lands, uh, recognizing the special relationship between their land and their cultural identity and their effective participation in leadership and political organization. This study also utilizes Bindia and Associates framework of seven classifications for indigenous governance mechanisms as seen on the screen. We'll be going over each of them later. However, given the datedness of existing data about Agtado Magat indigenous governance mechanisms, as well as the limited documentation of the role of the youth in these, this study evokes an emic definition of indigenous governance from Agtado Magat youth, recording their indigenous governance mechanism, mechanism, mechanisms based on their experience and documenting their current and their desired roles in these. Another concept is the concept of identity as a springboard in understanding indigenous youth, in which we combine different postulations of the concept, um, identity as mixed with the notion of identification, as materially rooted and tied to the notion of belonging, as fluid and as plural. Identity here concerns itself with the distinction of entities in relation to others and the, and the signification of relationships of similarity and difference. It also treats identity as entangled with material cultures that allow humans to express their sense of cultural togetherness and individuality. This produces plural and competing narratives about social identity, which are shaped by solidarity action through struggle. Along this vein, this study determines the Atadumagat youth's identity assertions based on a documentation of their current and desired roles in governance. 
So in terms of the methodology, we employed a purposive sample. We employed a purposive sampling in which we included members of the same Sierra Madre who are currently 18 years old and above and live in General Nakar in Quezon Province. So these criteria matter because we realize that these concepts or these bonding experiences reflect their ongoing engagement as a civil society group as well as being an organized indigenous youth in their own locality. So we also sought past ethnographies on Agta Domagat as well as NGO reports and resorted to co-designing three workshop style FGDs. Later we'll explain how co-production is mechanized in this study. In cases where digital divide or digital divide in terms of technology hampers the participants from engaging in Zoom, for example, sending multimedia content via created messenger or group chat and other more economic and viable means become alternative data that allows to demarginalize the data collection process between the investigators and the and the research partner. So ensuring co-ownership also entails the necessity to ensure the privacy. So in terms of the access that these indigenous peoples have, um, we have resorted to a Google Drive folder that allows both participants in the study to gain editing access and at the same time have a say in the research process. So in these sources, we aim to transcribe them into the, and translate them into how they express their indigenous governance mechanism under the lens of indigenous governance mechanism. Although we have limited data as of the moment, we recognize that these data still stand in terms of providing insights on how they navigate their social and cultural needs. Um, as Matthew mentioned, we regret that the findings and analysis portion may still be limited as of the moment, as we and our participants have not fully gone through the results under all of the mechanisms altogether. Nevertheless, we have come up with an unique definition of indigenous governance from our participants. The Agtado Magat youth define indigenous governance as plural and variegated, tethered to self-determination, and divorced from notions of development that are associated with development aggression. They indicate that Agtado Magat governance and its mechanisms bear many technical differences with the governance of other indigenous groups, although these may be similarly colored by shared experiences of encroachment. These shared experiences reinforce their thrust for belonging and self-determination, which is achieved through various strategies of resistance and accommodation to be discussed in a bit. Their self-determination, which is rooted in the protection of their ancestral domain, puts forward an ecological imperative to combat the social and environmental destruction carried out by development aggression. Thus, the ideal of their leadership is centered on protection rather than conquest. The distinction made between the governance of their elders in Kaksaan and the governance of the youth is that the former prioritizes the short-term gains of survival, while the latter focuses on the medium to long-term promise of cultural preservation. However, the youth recognize the necessity of involving themselves in survival strategies as well, so as to pursue their agenda for cultural preservation. And therefore, they seek acceptance into the governance mechanisms enacted by the traditional leadership of their elders and their kaksaan or their community leaders and the rest of their community or the rest of their pigtaanan. In the context of how they assert their identities amidst indigenous governance mechanisms, involving the system of rule, authority, leadership, and legitimacy entails the articulation of their opinions to their elders and kaksaan. May it be concerns on succession, on drinking as a social and community problem within indigenous communities, and working with community partners to capacitate themselves as leaders, such as, for example, participating in human rights activities. Socioeconomic activities also entail in their participation of community livelihoods, such as pag-uuway and other involvements concerning pakilapaan and assimilation of members within the youth organization to be more organized. Thirdly, and this is where they emphasize mostly of their assertion, is the, the, is the rehabilitation of their relationship within the representation of their community within lowlanders, that they are rather seen in a life where they could be capable and not backward, but rich and grounded in terms of environmental involvement. On the administration of their land tenure and property system, they request that elders explicitly instruct them about land management instead of sticking to old practice of practices of learning by observation. And this request is viable given the high mobility of the youth between their families' residential areas in the lowlands, which means that they cannot observe indigenous practices all the time. Also because of this, they tend to share communal property with their fellow youth 
and they offer their counsel to elders when the topic of lowland systems comes into play, as well as volunteer to represent their culture when the opportunity arises in the lowlands, such as in protest actions and cultural events. To shape public service delivery, they demand public services to be made accessible so that they, they can assert their specific needs, especially with regard to the emergence of the Kaliwa Dam. When these services are unavailable, for example, in terms of healthcare and food, they learn and use indigenous health and nutrition practices, and they transport products such as medicine and food to other pigtaanan. When these services are available, on the other hand, uh, such as roads, electric, and solar power, and with the COVID-19 pandemic requiring a shift to the digital setting, they accommodate these technologies to advance their agenda as indigenous peoples. For example, to create an online presence garnering support from netizens against the Kaliwa Dam project. They subsume the management and utilization of resources under the conduct of socioeconomic uh, and political activities and the land tenure and property system. But in the context of the Kaliwa Dam project, they participate in elder-led consultations and state-sponsored events surrounding lowlanders' long-standing attempts to secure their FDIC. Values and education um, as a joint mechanism is of prime concern to them, especially for advancing their social and environmental causes. They push for elderly-led education about their Indigenous Knowledge Systems and Practices, or IKSPs, and family-led learning about their mother tongue and their livelihood, even as they pursue formal studies to shape their skills development, leadership, etc., etc. And even as they practice Catholic or Christian faiths, they continue to pay homage to Makedapet, the Antadumagat God, valorizing Makedapet's rootedness in nature to ground their ecological projects, such as the Pakilapain Eco Farm. With their increasing development issues interplaying with COVID-19 and climate change, Antadumagat youth most prioritize their identity assertion in the organization of socioeconomic and political activities, justice and conflict system, and values in education. Although they operate outside of their traditional leadership systems and their political organization, their organization creates a platform for indigenous youth themselves to assert their role in these mechanisms, not necessarily as a precursor for them to assume their leadership, but rather as a bottom-up avenue for also for them to assert their preparation and acquiring recognition amidst various skills. So for them to assert their indigenous, for them to assert their indigenous indigenous identities, it involves the quest to attain different ideas that are rooted ultimately to the transmission of social environmentally rooted practices and knowledge systems towards and across generations. And with that, we thank you so much for listening and we now open our pieces for comments and questions. Thank you so much, uh, Matthew and Ange. All right, we now turn over the floor to our reviewers, Ms. Nota Magno and uh, Dr. Enrique Nino Leviste for their comments. Okay. Should I go first? Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Matthew. Good afternoon, Anj. Uh, first of all, congratulations no, uh, for coming up with... Um, so we say a commendable uh, set of data to support your claims when it comes to notions of indigenous governance. And practically, that's where I want to start as far as our conversation goes. No? Notions of indigenous governance. No? Uh, towards the end of your presentation, particularly your conclusion, you did mention how the Agta Dumagat youth uh, think or perceive or imagine no, indigenous governance. Um, perhaps moving forward, and you said so, no, so candidly anyway, that this is a work in progress, and we respect that, no. But it would be great, no, moving forward, no, to further strengthen and sharpen your paper, perhaps, no? to incorporate, if possible, no, from the conversations that you've had with uh, your community partners, no, from the indigenous youth, no, to articulate more clearly, no. And more systematically, these notions of governance, of indigenous governance, into uh, the presentation of findings no? or the presentation of data. Why is that important? Because after all, that is the core concept no? that your manuscript 
is focusing on. No? And so I think it would really be paramount for us to focus on that and to articulate that more systematically no? and more extensively if, if possible. So my question in relation to that is this. Um, in, in the process of conversing or working with your community partners, did you get a sense or did you get a thorough appreciation of um, tensions in terms of the meanings or the aspirations and the imaginings that they have when it comes to indigenous governance? Because it seems from the presentation and from actual data that is included here, um, it appears, and I may be wrong, no? you're the, the best people to, to, to uh, articulate this. It, it appears that they are in consensus when it comes to their definitions or their understandings of indigenous governance. Did you encounter such tensions? And if so, could you please describe these tensions to us? Hello, sir. Um, the tensions didn't necessarily come from um, one indigenous youth towards another. The tension we encountered were mostly um, internal reflections of, for example, how to conceptualize development. So, for example, they recognize the role of NCIP that um, they're unnecessary to, for them to assert the ancestral land claims. But at the same time, they also recognize their complicity in terms of how these extractive industries are allowed to flourish within their ancestral lands, for example. Another idea that I also recognize is on the service provision and delivery, in which participants um, pay definite attention on um, making sure that they're conscious of how they're portraying um, mainstream government or in this case formal government, which are not part of their indigenous governance. So for example, um, barangays who are meant to deliver um, healthcare services during the COVID-19. Um, they were clearly explicit about the rights-based assertion that it must be rooted on the traditions and it must be rooted on um, health equities. But at the same time, they also became conscious that if ever they were to highlight these inequalities, they would be unable to um, process this in a way that they would be more collaborative in terms of their um, participation towards the government. And I think um, taking precautions on how to interact with um, potential stakeholders matters for them, especially as um, they engage in civil society and they recognize that um, by stancing themselves as part of the civil society, they must be cautious not only within the community members themselves, but also how are they going to be received within the um, general society, especially when they have um, claims to assert that um, people nowadays seem to um, parang gloss over, like for example, yung kaliwada. Okay. Thank you, Matthew. At this point, I will turn over the virtual floor to uh, Ms. Magno, and then kung may follow-up pa din, uh, at may oras pa, I'll, I'll comment again. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Nino. Can you hear me um, fine? Okay. Yes, lang. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, well, taking, just taking this opportunity to say hello to everyone, kahit virtual lang. Hi, Nino. I see you. Cherry. Good job, Cherry. Whole day na si Cherry. Um, Hello, all the students who worked hard today and for the past few weeks. I know it's been um, quite stressful. We applaud you for being here. Um, pasensya na kayo. This, the process of graduating is really like this, no? Lalabas tayo sa butas ng karayom. So more on the butas ng karayom. Um, I will base my comments on... i sorry, Glenda Palau is also here. Sorry. Hi, Glenda. Hello, Singapore. Um, I'm basing my comments on your presentation, having received the manuscript a little late. And we'll get back to that in a bit. I, I have a suspicion why that was. Um, so based on your presentation, I think you've addressed a lot of these things that I had um, told you during your proposal. So the tricky, the tricky conceptual part in your study is um, linking governance, which is a formal institutional concept, with something less formal like indigenous political organization. No? So very important na maitahi sila. And legally, there are spaces along the constitution, IPRA, pero how they actually happen, like in the light of Kaliwa Dam and what they're doing about it, how do they practice leadership in the light of a new social issue, um, that's very important. So I think your study, um, I think it, 
it is able to capture the, the broad strokes of that uh, kind of a dynamic picture. Um, tapos, the way you did that was linking it with youth governance, so very specific yung focus nyo. Um, and youth governance is easier, it, it's easy to say, but it's tricky then with the I, actual IP kind of uh, leadership, which is based on age, diba? So how do young people add themselves to that? They're not old enough, no? Um, in your proposal, I, th I thought you were using strategic identity, the analytical concept of Father Alejo, strategic identity. Were you able to use it? Kasi parang siya yung mag-offer ng fluidity. In the, when Dia kasi is trying to... Um, parang classificatory yung handle ni Buendia. Like it's trying to, to create a, a matrix for different kinds of IP leadership. And that's tricky. As an anthropologist, uh, we, we're very invested in showing the dynamic picture. Kaya ang hahaba ng ethnography namin, di ba? Um, but, you know, it, you need it. Kasi you need, you need the context to, tell, to inform the people why... IPs behave the way that they do, lalo na in terms of leadership. Um, so that's my caution for Bendia. So I was wondering, that's my first question, wondering if you're able to utilize Alejo's analytical concept of strategic identity, that IPs actually use their identity to strategize in the world, lalo na about uh, what you're calling development aggression. Hi, ma'am. Um, unfortunately, we were only able to use two out of four concepts from Alejo's uh, framework of strategic identity, which is this, their actual strategic identities mm -hmm. and their solidarity strategies. For. This is because when we were um, in the process of data gathering, they were uh, asserting different characteristics of identity that we thought needed to be incorporated into the framework that we would be using into our analysis as well. Namely, po yung um, mixing identity with the fact that they are constantly in a process of identification. Um, yeah. The fact that yun po, and uh, the fact that materially rooted po yung identity nila and that uh -huh. very fluid and plural po yung identities that they have. Oh, Maybe because as we do knowledge production, sometimes it comes in layers. No, I don't expect you to get everything in one go. Pero ang maganda dun sa concept ni Father Alejo was. Um, it, it also parallels one of your findings, which is that the, the youth um, are the youth leadership is clinging to the self-ascription. Because lima yung defining characteristics of IP, diba? One of them is self-ascription. So they're using that to, to forge their leadership role. So maybe in the future, I don't know when you publish this, you can explore that a little further. Tapos my second question is more to the process of doing engaged anthropology in the form of participatory research. So in your proposal, you promised that they will be the SS MYVO will be part of your data gathering analysis, then ba in writing or authorship. So um, I want to know, I want to ask you how this process went for you as student researchers, how you feel about it, what were your challenges and the rewards from the process. Because one purpose of uh, engaged anthropology or participatory research is not just to include the IP in the knowledge production, but also to create teachable moments by way of reflecting upon the experience of actually doing participatory research. No, well, I'm not perfect, but if, if we can reflect upon it, then it builds on you know, future researchers being able to do participatory research. So I wanna know what, how you feel about it, what were your challenges, and the rewards from the process. Thank you so much for asking, Ma'am Nota. We really wanted to talk about this. Whereas uh, we as the principal investigators took most of the part in framing and writing the study, um, siguro po yung participatory aspect of SSMYVO is that they were the ones who modified and refined uh, the interview and focus group questions, as well as help arrange the program flow. So all of yeah. us worked together on a Google Sheet where they could uh, edit um, the flow of the pro program and as they saw fit, and also emphasize which questions they wanted to flesh out more. Um, yeah. As for analyzing the results, po, this is where we had a very hard time 
kasi po when we had the FGDs um it's yung tendency po is it's the same people attending the FGDs lang po mm-hmm. and then um when it comes to yung analysis po sila lang din po yung mga nakakasama namin and hindi na po namin mahagilap yung iba um synchronously so asynchronously na lang po mostly nang nangyari yung analysis which wasn't our original intention so mm-hmm. um it really affected po yung um, writing namin ng analysis. That's why din po sobrang natagalan kami. And that's why until now, in the process pa rin po. But yeah, you do understand that, that I was, that's I was going to say in the beginning, I suspect that had something to do with it. Kasi participatory research takes time. And there is one, one famous research that took 10 years just to get, uh, you know, organic approval of the community and then, you know, getting them along on the project. So nakatikim kayo. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And I hope I I didn't see it in the presentation, but I hope you make it come out in the manuscript. Okay. Because if you make a claim to participatory research, your your text should be reflexively written uh, with regard to the process, how you how you did it, how you got there. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Paul. Um, I think Matthew can talk a little more about your um rewards and other stuff. Um. Um, hello, po. Um, thank you again po for asking this question because I think um, it was um, the idea of Prof. Mary to um, push forward the idea of knowledge management as a co-creative process that allowed us to flesh out yung, the potential of reflexivity in the study. Because initially, we were conceiving that since we're contextualized in the pandemic, that the role of digital technology may also affect how they mobilize this indigenous youth. Pero as we go with the participatory processes, parang the only slightest acknowledgement of the role of technology was that um, parang one participant analogized the use of Zoom in terms of explaining indigenous leadership. Pero in terms of their digital engagements, uh, parang more if this was just an intermediary, parang technology was um, an intermediary for us to connect in spite of um, being unable due to um, the millions of pandemic restrictions. But nonetheless, din po, um, what we also identified then po with the participatory research is the fact that it's also difficult for us to establish the, um, it, or how to flesh out in practice the capacity of indigenous youth to challenge the unidire- unidirectional view of anthropology. Because most of the time, parang what, uh, what engagement or what the literature we have read is mostly coming from um, parang either extractive yung anthropologist with the indigenous um, practices or either more of that, parang it alludes to the banking theory of education where parang kailangan salina ng knowledge yung IPs in order to be responsive. But um, our, parang while our interviews and uh, other parang pahikipagkwentuhan allowed them to kahit pa paano fo- fo- um, proffer some forms of local knowledge which um, in the lens of other parang, for example, political science would um, naturally gloss over um, forms of knowledges and how they experience indigenous governance. Um, how they um, actively partake, for example, in challenging po yung notions um, is also parang a difficult process din po in ensuring that their engagement um, isn't merely parang um, a tape of, parang a large tape of um, parang consensus because we um, really see um, the possibility of um, heterogeneity in terms of indigenous views. Pero um, mm-hmm. because we were in a limited context din po, we were unable din po to gauge how, for example, in a physical in a physical setting, para how they would react in the moment when they were uh-huh. when they were encountering everyday situations like, for example, discrimination in the lowlands, for example. So we were limited on that on that aspect in in terms of knowing their life world space people. Okay, uh, that's fine. Just make sure to write it down, because in the knowledge production process, dapat malinaw san kayo ng gagaling, no? Be sure to write it down. Um, my last point, at saka maganda yung question ni, ni Dr. Leviste about the, if there were tensions nga, you were alluding to heterogeneity in views, that maybe you didn't see the nuances kasi limited yung approach, no? given the pandemic situation. Just make sure you write the process down. Um, my last one would be just a gentle reminder that when you're writing about IP, because they're a vulnerable group, no? the ethical weight is on your shoulders. As you write about them, you represent them. No, it's an act of representation. So the best you can do is like 
talagang linawin niyo yung process of how you create this knowledge. Right? Para malinaw sa reader. Yeah, la- konting push na lang. You'll be on the other side of the butas ng karayong. Thank you so much, ma'am. And we will Thank take you. this into consideration then, especially as um, we're aiming to have more of their participation in the next few weeks pag natapos na yung uh, schooling nila. Um, so, baka makapag-participate sila more in the writing. And we'll be talking to them as well about the, pos- uh, the possibility of getting published in a journal. So, mm-hmm. ayun po. Yeah. Yeah, permissions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Leviste. Matthew and Ange, thank you for your presentation. Thank you, uh, Nota and Nino, for your feedback. Thank you also, Dr. Raselis, for the guidance. Can I say something? Unless you want to end this. Go ahead. Yeah, <clears throat> let, let me just say that these are two very talented young people who chose a very difficult, you know, layout or issue in a very difficult time because of the pandemic and no field work, right? But I, what I, so you've all commented, I think, very usefully for them, and we will follow up together with them. But I just wanted to say for the department, you know, it just struck me as Nota Magna was raising the question of when you get into co generation of knowledge, which as you know, I'm very much interested in, what this has shown is maybe this thesis process, if it's co-generated, which means from the beginning, whoever is going to be your partner should already be there. So this takes a year. And therefore, maybe the department for certain types of research that are supposed to be co-generated, has to start right in the beginning of the first semester, the first month, already talking to the co-participants, right? So, I mean, this just struck me because I learned that actually from thinking through. That's one. The other is that this is kind of more a hope. I have found with some grad students who have gone into this type of work, they get so invested in the people. That was, of course, when you had more actual field work, huh? that they, the semester ends, maybe they graduate, but they're involved. They don't stop. You know, They may stop doing active research if they're working at something else, but their connections with the community become part of the bonds they have created. And to the extent that you know, if they're the anthropologist or have that background, to me, that's a very important, maybe sideline, if you want to call it that, although maybe in the end, that's the most important. And I'm not saying that, you know, Ange or Matthew are now committed to always to stay with them even after they graduate. But I think for the department, this is one of the great achievements of, of this kind of process that many of our students will want to continue. And maybe the department should think about, is there a way we can facilitate that continuing process, right? For some really long-term connections. That's it. Thank you. So thank good for you too. I'm cheering for you. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Reselis. And thank you again to our presenters and reviewers. I hope we can continue and sustain this connection with our communities. All right. Thank you once again. We may now proceed with our third presenter for this panel. Um, Joanne Axibal, Jel Lames, and Katrin Yuzon will be presenting their work entitled Usad Kabataan, a study on youth-led organizations and youth-led church programs amidst the COVID-19 pandemic in the Philippines. Their work is supervised by Dr. Glenda Wee and their reviewers with us on site is Dr. Enrique Nyoleviste and Mr. Skiltila Bastilla, also here with us, and Ms. Gigi Aguirre, who is with us via Zoom. All right, take it away. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here with us today, especially to our um, thesis advisor, Ma'am Glenda, um, our thesis reviewer, Sir Nino, uh, Ma'am Gigi, and Sir Skilti. All right, so to give you a brief overview of what we will be covering, 
Um, for this presentation, we're going to be discussing the introduction of our study, um, our research problem and questions, and our objectives, theoretical framework, methodology, findings and analysis, and lastly, conclusion and recommendation. So what is youth civic engagement? Youth civic engagement pertains to the initiative of the youth to work towards making a change within their communities by addressing pressing societal issues which is largely done through their participation in organizations driven by missions and advocacies. The study of youth civic engagement is important because it leads to the mobilization of social action is in responding to concern faced by communities. The pandemic led youth to express grave concerns about the impacts of the COVID-19 crisis. With this, youth organizations in the Philippines have been active in responding to the societal concerns by carrying out their programs to aid those who are affected. Therefore, to continuously encourage the youth to be socially aware and to join civic engagements, it is significant to study their motivation to know what would keep them actively participate. So this then leads us to the research problem. Um, research shows us that the youth's motivation has significantly decreased due to the pandemic. As per the International Labor Organization, it also affected their perceptions of their future careers, education, mental health, and social activism. When motivation is low, it is common for the youth to have no desire to participate in any social activities given the difficulty of having everything done online. In addition to this, youth-led organizations have also needed to stop their operations. This is vital, most especially if these organizations are community-based because they can no longer visit or communicate with their beneficiaries given the strict implementation of lockdowns and other government policies. It is important to note as well that these youth-led organizations and activities are also not being given enough credit by the national government. This leads to less exposure to the general public, which could also lessen the number of new volunteers coming in. And naturally, given the context of the pandemic, it is essential that more people join organizations to address the concerns of the oppressed and marginalized communities. And with this, we now present our research questions. So first, we want to know, how does the social capital from schools, churches, friends, and family affect youth's participation in civic engagements? How do youth-led organization members perceive their activities and advocacies amid the challenges faced during this pandemic? What are the motivations behind youth-led organization members living out their advocacies during the pandemic? And lastly, what recommendations can be drawn to encourage the youth to be involved in civic organizations? Um, I, I now pass the floor over to Joe to discuss the objectives of our study. In line with our research questions, um, we wanted to examine how the social capital of the Filipino youth affects their participation and motivation in civic activities despite the challenges brought forth by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we also wanted to understand how the youth develop their motivations toward their civic engagement, specifically by examining their extrinsic and intrinsic motivations, will be this, uh, which will be discussed later on. For our methodology, um, this study uses qualitative data gathered from in-depth interviews and also literature from secondary sources. So um, to give a background from our uh, respondents, they are from Landas ng Karunungan Organization and the Initiative PH. Um, Landas ng Karunungan is a youth-led church organization under Santa Maria de la Strada Parish that focuses on giving financial aid to low-income parishioners and providing educational assistance to students through formation activities for their holistic development, specifically giving um, tutorial programs to elementary students and conducting webinars as well and workshops for skills development. On the other hand, the Initiative PH is a nonprofit youth led organization that serves as a platform for young people to develop initiatives catered to poor and vulnerable communities. And they also serve as an avenue for youth advocates to voice their concerns and raise awareness on the pressing social issues in the Philippine society through webinars and workshops. So um, we use purposive sampling, and the total respondents that we got was 29. And the age group was 18 to 22 years old and the students are ranging from first years to fourth year college. The participants have been uh, part of their respective organizations for more than a year and majority have been active ever since they joined. 
Um, their insights are significant in understanding and analyzing the role of social capital in affecting their motivation in participating in civic engagements. So moving forward with the theor theoretical framework, in this study, we are working under the assumption that social capital leads to motivation. We will then focus on analyzing the several factors that fall under social capital, which motivate our respondents to participate in civic engagement, namely school and church, as well as friends and family. We chose these under the premise that social capital is produced by actors who are subjected to their social structures, ranging from simple setups like friends and family to more distinct setups like schools and churches. We also included in our framework the self-determination theory, which looks at how individuals develop motivation based on how they absorb social contexts. It has also argued that different types of motivation affect how an individual performs, and in our study, we look at how it affects their activeness despite the pandemic. So just to show quickly, here's a diagram of the self-determination theory, and under motivation, there is a concept called regulation, which pertains to the process itself of the individual absorbing the social context and eventually converting these into motivation. We won't go over this because of time constraints, but we will mention these in the findings and analysis section later. So all in all, here's a diagram of our framework. Going over the types of motivation, there are essentially two types of motivation, namely intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. What sets them apart is essentially the level of autonomy, meaning how much the external factors influence their actions. We'll start off with extrinsic, which means that this type of motivation is heavily influenced by external factors, such as social capital, but also other factors such as rewards, self-esteem traits like pride, and more. So lastly, for in intrinsic motivation, this type comes directly from a person's own volition or willingness that may be connected to personal feelings and experiences and therefore is free from any external influences. This is also considered the most autonomous because this type of motivation allows the individual to act on their own. And with this, we now move on to our findings and analysis. Um, in analyzing the participants' answers more closely, it can be said that the majority of respondents who strongly felt that school had something to do with their motivation were from the initiative PH with 9 out of 14 saying yes while only one respondent from LNK agreed. According to the respondents, um, teachers, class or subjects, um, schoolmates and school organizations had significant roles in encouraging them to join advocacy organizations and to be productive members of society. So as seen on the screen, um, one participant mentioned that her being in Hume's strand exposed her to societal issues and gave her an idea on how social work goes. Therefore, she was encouraged to join. So additionally, one participant from TIFF as well shared how her immer immersion was an interesting experience where she was exposed to the lives of the poor. For both TIFF and Ellen K, their teachers were remarkable in encouraging them to join. So one participant even directly quoted his teacher just to point out that he was inspired by it and it made him realize as well that he hadn't been a part of any um, organizations that could help his neighbor. Thus, he joined the initiative PH. And for the respondent from LNK, um, her teacher in religion simply um, invited her to join. So moving on to churches, we found out that the majority of the interviewees from TIFF were not influenced by their church or religion. Although there are a few who have mentioned that they have learned values from their religion that ultimately pushed them towards engaging in their advocacies. For instance, a respondent mentioned that there is a great influence in their religion because as a Roman Catholic, they think it is always advertised in their religion to be loving of others. And for them, this played a part in them joining the org. Um, on the other hand, all of our respondents from LNK mentioned that the church influenced them to join the org because mainly they had a church mate who told them about the org and, pus and pushed them to join. Additionally, one of the respondents mentioned that they, them, that they find themselves wanting to contribute to the church from time to time, and so this pushed them to be active in the org. So all in all, it is safe to say that the church and religion has influenced the interviewees from both organizations to some extent, although not entirely. So for friends, more than half of the total number of respondents directly answered friends when asked about the reasons for joining. So for TIFF, only 7 out of 14 were motivated by friends. And even so, the other members make it a point to welcome them through game nights or casual no-work bonding sessions. 
This is especially important for TIFF because most of their work requires, co requires collaboration with their other team members. As for LNK, 10 out of 15 named friends as their main reasons for joining. It is to note that many of them were also motivated to apply because of the scholarship the org was providing. Whether they, whether they came in alone or with friends, it was agreed that the members, along with Mom Che, their supervisor, became like a second family to them and that they found new friends thanks to LNK. With this, we can see that the common theme for both when asked what made them stay or remain active in the org would be because the participants, along with their friends, have been through a lot together as members of their organizations. Although family could indeed be just as strongly influential as friends, only the minority of the participants considered their family as the motivation for them to join organizations. To be more specific, only the participants from LNK claimed that their parents had something to do with their joining the organization because either their parents serve the church itself or are part um, of uh, church organizations such as Couples for Christ. Um, with this, it can be concluded that although only the minority of the participants find their family influential, it is important to note that the parents or family members can set a good example for the youth to be encouraged and motivated, as seen in the context of the participants who agree that their family has influenced them. So for the purpose of our study, we define extrinsic motivation as joining the organization for reasons other than supporting the advocacies. Our participants, for the most part, are extrinsically motivated in the initial stages of their civic engagement because they mentioned that their social capital has influenced them to join. And for, just for another general finding, recalling the concept of regulation I mentioned a while ago, there is one type called the external regulation, which means that the motivation comes from an external reward contingency. So with this, we discovered that none of our respondents fall under this type because none of them join their organizations expecting something in return. For instance, one of the respondents said that there should be no other hidden intentions to join other than you simply want to do good. Uh, moving on, identified regulation also falls under the extrinsic motivation. And this means that the motivation comes from the conscious valuing of a certain goal. We found out that our respondents generally fall under this upon joining because they have mentioned that they want to positively contribute to society and specifically for LNK members, they feel the need to give back to the church out of gratitude, or in other words, other words, there is utang na loob. So moving on to intrinsic motivation, according to Dawson Larson, there are three types. First is learning for the future. This was seen in TIFF through the participants taking advantage of leadership roles to help them build confidence in their work and people skills. For LNK, it was seen through the scholars actively attending their math and English tutorials for advanced learning in their future classes. Second is developing a sense of competence. Many of the participants in TIFF said that they've become comfortable around their peers, making it easier to hear and give feedback to one another. However, the same cannot be said about LNK because there are not a lot of opportunities and also a need for the members to collaborate. And last is pursuing purpose. Among the three, this was the most emphasized among all the participants. In TIFF, the participants were most passionate about being a voice for their communities and for LNK, their purpose was to give back to the church. All right, so to wrap up, we wanted to answer our research questions. Um, first, social capital through schools, churches, friends, and family allowed youth to become aware of the societal issues. Therefore, they wanted to give back. Um, they also were inspired by their family, encouraged by their peers, uh, peers and friends. And therefore, for these reasons, uh, they were motivated to join organizations. Um, the youth don't see what they do as an obligation, but they personally wanted to positively contribute to society, even though at times they are struggling with um, juggling different responsibilities. Um, their goal to help people prevails. Um, third, youth continuously leave out their advocacies because they feel fulfilled when they do activities, efforts, and initiatives, and it warms their heart to see that their efforts are making a difference. And lastly, because they simply just want to offer help to those who are, are oppressed and being in a civic organization make them um, socially active as well. For the final point of our research, let's now go to the recommendation. So to close our presentation, we've drawn up recommendations directed to churches, schools, friends, and families to further encourage the youth to be active in their civic engagement. So firstly, 
It is great that the church has taught certain values that have pushed members to be active towards their advocacies, and it may be able, able to do even more by utilizing social media to discuss the church's initiatives and to promote these. Um, next, schools may also be able to encourage more youth to participate in civic engagement by having seminars or talks that discuss pressing societal issues and what the youth may be able to do to help. So moving on, with friends being the biggest influence that the participants identified, the continuous sharing of advocacy organizations to one circle of friends can highly increase the interest of others, which can also help increase, which can, which can also overall increase youth's participation in civic engagements. And lastly, families may still play an important role in this. They may have open discussions about societal issues that may further enlighten the youth, as well as positively encouraging them to be able to help in their own ways. So that is all for our presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much to the research team. Uh, now we turn over the floor to our reviewers, Dr. Leviste, Mr. Labastilla, and Ms. Aguirre. Hi. Oh, wait. Hello, the background is still my my virtual background, but I, I'm on I'm on campus now. Let me just change this. Okay. Um, there. I'm in the room. Uh, yeah, uh, congratulations, uh, at uh, Joe and Jell for uh, getting to this point and presenting your your uh, baby uh, to to the public um, I appreciate the way you wrote the manuscript it's uh, it's very easy to follow um, and it's very readable so uh, congrats on that um, I also appreciate that you you were able to integrate or incorporate some of the feedback from the proposal uh, especially about um, integrating the social more of the social dimension rather than rely on uh, motivation um, I have a couple of questions and comments to to help you improve uh, your manuscript um, first of all I, I I know that social capital is not one of the concepts uh, in your framework last time right I wanted to ask how you thought about using social capital um, in your framework. What was the process like? Okay, sir. So to answer your question, um, as we meant, as you may know that we initially stuck with the self-determination theory, and upon your comments, we actually integrated social capital af after. And so uh, we just like to point out that um, under self-determination theory there is the extrinsic and intrinsic motivation. And with following that line of thought, um, we integrated social capital in a way that it relates to the theory by um, pointing out that social capital is mainly found in the extrinsic motivation part of the theory um, because it is composed of people surrounding the individual and that makes it external. And so we'd like also to point out that um, the extrinsic motivation may eventually lead to intrinsic motivation as, uh, as seen in our respondents that they have come to learn to love what they do in their organizations, that they find purpose in it and what meanings they abs ascribe to it and that they find fulfillment in what they do, that they get to contribute to society. So. All right. Thank you. Uh, I think I, I understand um, the, 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 the thinking process of incorporating social capital. Um, my my issue with with your use of social capital in your study is it's not fully fleshed out um you're you tend to equate social capital with social institutions why don't you think it's automatic that because it's school church friends and family uh social capital is already there um 
you can actually take out the social capital part and just explain that school, church, friends, and family as these as social institutions um, have an impact on extrinsic motivation, right? And can you can I mean your your thesis can still be be uh, argued that way uh, because social capital has has its own uh, discourse and literature, and it's not found in your in your um, in your manuscript, parang parang sinabi niya lang na uh, in school um, because students are enrolled in school and some of the lessons they learned in school tell them to you know to join organizations etc. That's not necessarily social capital. Um, social capital may 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 discourse siya. Paano ba nag nag nabibuild yung trust among students among members of the school community, right? And and that's not found in your in your data. So um, my suggestion, Siguro, is if you really uh, um, bent on using social capital, then you need to read more on how the members of LNK and TIF um, uh, establish social capital in these social institutions with their friends, with their family, in their church. Paano, na, paano nila na, na build yung social capital? sa mga institutions na ito, right? Or, remove social capital altogether. Kasi pwede mo nyo explain na um, institutions mismo, social institutions, can impact or can affect uh, the extrinsic motivation part. So, doon na lang kayo mag-build. No? Tanggalin nyo yung social capital, but expand on the self uh, self-motivation uh, theory um, by by um, expanding on the extrinsic motivation part. Di ba? Paano itong ibang mga institutions na ito, yung apat na ito, ay nakaka-influensya sa uh, motivation ng members. So, yun yung pinaka-main comment ko. Um, I have a couple other... Wait lang. Let me just look at the uh, manuscript. I think that that's the main one. Um Sigur, the, the other one would be your abstract. I think um, I have a feeling that you, you did the abstract um, um, last. And, and it's ganun naman talaga ginagawa. No? Pag tapos na lahat, gagawin yung abstract. But I, think, I feel like you got the abstract from your proposal and just uh, revised the last few parts. Ang nangyari tuloy, Walang, walang laman yung abstract nyo in terms of your findings, main findings and analysis. Um, parang halos proposal yung dating for the first um, like three-fourths of, of the abstract. And then sinabi nyo na lang how, how, you will, how you will analyze. Pero dapat sa abstract pa lang makita na yung main findings nyo and yung, yung analysis. No? So importante, importante yun. I think you need to, to uh, look at this again. So yeah, those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Coach okay. Kilty, sinabi mong idagdag nila social capital tapos ngayon ipapatanggal mo. <laughs> Sorry. Actually, nandun naman siya lahat. They just need to expound siguro. Kasi, of course, uh, all these interrelationships, all these transactions do not happen in a vacuum. So, naiintindihan ko naman yung point is guilty. Mas magiging kasing substantive yung thesis nyo, yung paper nyo, kung na-explain ng mabuti kung ano ibig, yung, ibig sabihin ng... Siguro anong ibig sabihin ng social capital from the perspective of the youth, no? Oo, kasi baka... Ako kasi palagi akong voices, no? So, natutuwa ako at yung report nyo, yung paper nyo, incorporates themes, summaries, as well as the voices of young people, no? Kaya lang, um, I appreciate really na you're taking efforts to study youth civic engagement. Kaya lang, as I was reading your paper, ang nakikita ko youth, parang homogeneous. So, nasaan yung female youth? Nasaan yung male youth? Doon sa voices, nasaan yung LGBTQ? Uh, I was looking for my perspectives pa na pagkakaiba 
kung ang nagsasalita ay coming from an urban poor youth na nasa eskwelahan. Oo. So, uh, I understand that this research was undertaken in a pandemic situation. Uh, kaya lang siguro, baka pwede niyong tingnan doon sa existing yun na, na database kung baka pwede pang mas himayin, no? para ma-surface natin yung perspectives nung ano nung analysis nyo going beyond the numbers of male and female ang question ko ay other commonalities or differences between and among how young people identify themselves perhaps add something like this narrative is attributed to a female school youth age at 20 who perhaps has a solo parent kasi uh, kahit nasabihin natin na parang walang influence yung family, I think yung mga young people, motivated sila to join kasi gusto rin nang lumabas ng bahay. So parang it's the other way around. Kasi yun ang naririnig ko eh sa mga kwentuhan namin with young people. Ay ma'am, gusto kong lumabas kasi ganyan, ganyan, ganyan. So baka pwede pa yun i-explore, no? Uh, okay. And then, you know, uh, do you have insights that could also make us understand differences or similarities between schooling youth in terms of socioeconomic status, no? Or perhaps the source of household income or the parents' income, you know? So does belonging to families with regular sources of income become a factor in deciding uh, to join or not join or to be motivated in staying on? In short, do family or household fortunes or misfortunes count? in terms of motivation, no? And if it does, how does the youth, male, female, etc., navigate the engagement, no? Yung sa diagram nyo naman, I understand na dalawa nga siyang frameworks. Kaya lang, ang ko kasi, ano siya, hindi lang siya one way, kailangan two way siya, the street, no? Kasi parang lahat siya pababa. Oo, at some point, meron yung interaction kasi hindi naman ito concepts lang. Uh, nung binabasa ko nga yung thesis nyo, ang nakikita ko parang parang diagram lang ng tao. Kaya wala akong makita na itong nagsasalita, nagsasalita na ito ay babae, lalaki, uh, mahirap, uh, indigenous people, yung mga ganun ba? Uh -huh. So, yun, siguro, uh, kung paper naman siya, Perhaps you can add some kind of a narrative focusing on one respondent. Kinikwento niya kung paano siya na-engage, na-involved, and how she has uh, uh, continue become being a member. Pero ang ano ko rin kasi, parang ang nakita ko ngayon lang is yung youth perspective, yung magkaibang points. Yung isa na organization, sila ay youth-led. So sila yung mga leaders, no? Tama? And then yung isa naman, sila ay members. So magkaiba yun. Magkaibang points of ano yun. Uh, motivation siguro, hindi ko alam. So yan, yan na lang muna. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Hello again. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Kat, Joe, and Jel. No? Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate you kasi uh, kagaya nga nung sabi ni Skilty kanina, no? uh, prior to our presentation today, no? My observation before when you were presenting your proposal was that it was a predominantly psychological paper. There's nothing wrong with that, right? But of course, I know no na kaya nyo namang palabasin yung sociological. No, and, and you did that by introducing uh, the concept of social capital. Now, my first comment is certainly dependent on your ultimate decision whether or not to push through with the social capital concept. Should you decide to push through with it, and that's something that I will, you will certainly have discretion over together with Dr. Wee. If you decide to push through with it, probably a, a, a helpful approach, no, a helpful approach and a useful one at that would be to determine different forms of social capital. And there are three, no, there's bonding social capital, which happens within a group, Limbawa, LNK. How do they bond? What is the nature of their bonding? And what makes them tick? What makes them stick together despite trying times no? in the context of a pandemic? That's bonding capital. Meron din namang bridging capital, which is actually across groups. No? Limbawa, yung TIF. Meron ba yung TIF na parang collaborate on a particular activity or project in the context of a pandemic? So these are just yung yung pang yung panghuli 
linking uh, social capital, yun, yun mas extensive na because you're talking about several groups already. Now, you don't have to look at all three. No, hindi niyo naman kailangan pilitin na kailangan itong tatlong to masaklaw namin. Pero baka, if you decide ultimately to pursue social capital as a key concept in your study, pwede siguro kayong mamili. Batay sa datos na meron kayo, pwede niyong tingnan which is more magnified. Is it the bonding kind which is more internal to LNK or to TIF? Or are there also indications of uh, bridging? No, across. No, so yeah, so that's my first comment. So something that you will decide on. No, should you really opt for the social capital bit? No. Uh, again, the second comment, naman, and this is my last comment for the afternoon, um, is also still on social capital. Because when you talk about social capital, it's paramount to also discuss how it creates inequality or how it creates differences. Um. Does your data uh, cover that or capture that? No? So something to, to also look into no? as you refine and further sharpen your, your paper. Lang. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Um, sorry, sir. I just wanted to clarify things. Po. When you mentioned po about um, in social capital and how it creates inequality and differences, um, I think it's important to note din po that um, the participants from TIFF actually said that um, their school had um, something to do with their motivation po, right? Mm -hmm. And then for LNK naman, um, wala po masyado. Mm -hmm. um, this is because I guess um, the, the respondents from TIFF po are um, mostly from um, quote-unquote prestigious school, mm -hmm. should I say. So they're from um, Ateneo, La Salle, mm -hmm. um, FEU, UP. So I think they have more you know, um, programs and subjects catered to um, parang focus on helping other people, mm -hmm. you know, them being exposed in um, societal problems, mm -hmm. unlike those for uh, LNK. Mm -hmm. So I think um, you're correct po, that social capital brings inequalities then po among them. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Joe. Thanks. So yun nga, maganda ang tingnan yung bridging kasi if if uh, this actually or this talent sorry engages with other groups. At if so, oh, oh, if so, maganda rin tingnan kung may panahon pa kayong tingnan yung interaction not only with it but also across the other groups. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Jerry, quick point lang. Go ahead, Skilty. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just a final, a final quick point. Um, this is related to uh, GGs and Mary also actually has a comment in Zoom about the framework. Because um, right now the the analysis proceeds like there are two distinctly separate uh, frameworks. <laughs> so, parang unang analysis is social capital. And then the second part is the motivation framework. Walang link between the two. Or kung meron man, hindi siya malinaw. So kung, kung gagamitin yung social capital, I hope that you really integrate it with the, with the other framework. Na kung baga, uh, nga, dynamic yung, yung relationship ng concepts. Hindi siya separate discussion. Yeah. If I may, I'd like to read uh, Mary's comment on Zoom. She says, I agree with Gigi's point about interaction going up and down. You hypothesize that participation is the result of social capital, but doesn't participation itself then add new dimensions to social capital or the institutions that you say generated? Hence, there's a feedback mechanism at work. In your pictorial representation of your theoretical framework, why not show a more interactive dynamic systems framework rather than a cascading unidimensional cause and effect model? Your data actually express systems modes. Right? That was from Dr. Mary Roselis. Uh, thank you so much, um, Dr. Riselli. So we actually realized that uh, major too late now, but from the high from Hyman's work, um, that's the basis of our theoretical framework. So according to Hyman, um, civic engagement um do lead to social capital. 
So um, it should be it should really be a dynamic um interaction. So yes, we can modify our theoretical framework. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much to the research team and congratulations once again. Thank you. Thank you so much to our reviewers, both on site and online, and of course to your uh, uh, supervisor, Dr. Glenda Wee. Thank you so much, and I think we can go on a five minute break before we resume with our next panel. Thank you so much.
Hello everyone, good afternoon once again. Uh, we would like to welcome you to the fourth panel of today's Undergraduate Student Research Conference. The fourth and final panel of this afternoon is entitled Stories of Subalternity Spaces of Empowerment. We have two groups presenting under this panel. Um, and first, the first group to present will be joined by Anthony Gabriel Alcantara and Kyla Sevilla, Sevilla, who will be presenting Game Changer, Gender Inequality in the Gaming Spaces and Patterns of Resistance by Filipina Gamers. They are supervised by Ms. Jesse Claudio and with us, our reviewers uh, will be Dr. Uh, sorry, Mr. J.P. Dalupang and Ms. Emily Roque Sarmiento. All right, Kyla and uh, Gap, take it away. My screen is in. Yes, Kyle. Okay, all right. So good afternoon, everyone. We are Gabby Alcantara and Kyla Sevilla, and we will be presenting to you our research entitled Game Changer, Gender Inequality in the Gaming Space and Patterns of Resistance by Filipino Gamers. So to start, um, online gaming, it is one of the most common pastimes practiced by a number of people. There is a continuous growth in the demographics of players. The female demographic has grown in lockstep with the worldwide and local growth of the online gaming community with 40% of gamers in Asia and 48% in the Philippines being female. However, recent studies show that the gaming industry remains to be dominated by males, only with traditional gender stereotypes reinforced and reproduced. This reproduction translates to the continued discrimination of women in modern leisure spaces that uphold the male hegemony. Literature on traditional leisure shows that there have been long-standing barriers for women to fully access leisure because they were historically involved in domestic care or child care, and men who made up the majority of the working demographic were more acceptable to use time in leisure. This caused the division of space into private, which is available for females, and public, which is exclusive for males. And in the Philippines, being female was negatively linked to leisure activities. The online gaming space became a hybrid of public and private leisure spaces. It is a venue for socialization that can be enjoyed in the comfort of one's own bedroom. However, this mix only caused an overlapping zone of contest for female gamers. The access was still met with the same stereotypes that subverted them long before, like objectification, notions of inferiority, and when they choose to stand up to their gender, they are given social punishments. Given these, our study aims to examine the gaming space and explore how female gamers navigate it, including their patterns of resistance, and then propose recommendations for the gaming community. Moreover, we recognize the gaps in the literature on the topic. There are only a few studies in the Philippine context, but because local practices may influence how gamers play, this study aims to contribute to the body of literature through exploring the narratives of gamers in the Philippines. The researchers will address these main research questions. First, how are stereotypes about female gamers reproduced in the gaming space? Next, how do these stereotypes affect how female gamers do gender in a masculine-oriented gaming subculture? And lastly, in what ways do female gamers undo gender in the male-dominated gaming environment? For our theoretical framework, we have combined three theories and situated these in their corresponding locations within our conceptual framework. By basing on our literature, our conceptual framework illustrates the journey of a female gamer through the gaming space. Pre-entry to the gaming space, there are already pre-existing gender stereotypes and notions of female gamers. They, the study utilizes gender framing by Cecilia Ridgway, which uses gender as a framing device to relate to others. Then, in entering, the na at entering and navigating the gaming space, we will examine how one does their gender. Doing gender by Wes Zimmerman posits the behavior. The behaviors are posits that behaviors are assessed based on the acceptance accepted conceptions of gender, and in this case, based on stereotypes of female gamers. Lastly. Doing gender may elicit certain responses as one's actions are being assessed through the aforementioned framing of gender. These responses, in the case of female gamers who contest their presence in the gaming space, are manifestations of their attributed inferiority in society. These responses then become social punishments. With these punishments, female gamers cope through their accept 
through either accepting their sanctions or resisting and creating mode, models, modes of empowerment. The latter, which we will discuss more, is a rising dynamic within the gaming community and magnifies the call for structural changes in the gaming industry. For the methodology, the study focused on these top three multiplayer online games in the Philippines, Valorant, Mobile Legends, Bang Bang, and Call of Duty Mobile. We were able to gather six female gamers and six male gamers who volunteered in Facebook, in Facebook gaming communities and referrals. Moreover, the gamers needed to qualify for these certain criteria to be included listed below. We observed gameplay for, of each player through participant observation and held interviews afterwards. We conducted two focus group discussions for female gamers, which would validate the common experiences each female gamer had, as well as encourage further discussion on discrimination and resistance or empowerment. All these methods were conducted through discord and complied with ethical measures on consent, privacy, anonymity, and discussions of potentially triggering topics. For the discussion of our results, we will start off with the conditions outside of the gaming space. Before a female game gamer enters the gaming space, they are already framed due to the pre-existing stereotypes regarding female gamers and females generally, which are reproductions of the traditional stereotypes. These notions affect the female gamer identity, usually in a discriminatory manner. The data shows that majority of female characters are hypersexualized with stereotypical people of Jewish bodies. Moreover, as this female game, as male ga this male gamer expressed, that the games usually design characters and skins to appeal to the preferences of the majority audience who are male gamers. Being female also translates to weakness and submissiveness in the game. Female gamers are not highly believably skillful, and this trickles down to the character roles. Majority of the female characters fulfill support or assist roles, and female gamers are given these. Are given these males are given these. Males usually take on the core or initiator roles. The female gamer then enters the gaming space given this framing. Since the gaming space blurs geographical boundaries, anonymity is made uh, available. Thus, games in general can decide to either conceal their gender or reveal it. Um, or as posited in the doing gender theory, gender can be expressed through interaction and in the case of gaming, through voice chat. From our data, male gamers prefer to reveal their gender for faster communication. Female gamers do not because of their fear of discrimination. They tend to set a condition before they reveal their gender. They express how they need to be skillful first during the match in order to gain their right or confidence to talk. Some respondents also gender swap where they disguise their voices to that of males. When revealing that they are female, gender assessment occurs, as laid out by the doing gender theory. Multiple literature cited that discrimination is a common and acceptable repercussion for doing this, and it is also expressed in our data. These punishments revolve around the reproduced stereotypes discussed. Trash talking, which is a form of insulting, occurs frequently towards female players. Majority of the insults are about their gender. For example, quote unquote, you don't belong here, or I baba, I weak. It was also common for the respondents to express the severity of trash talk in the Philippine context with toxic, harsher, and below the belt insults, thus expressing their um, preference to play in other servers in other countries. Female gamers also experience simping or flirting, wherein male players show romantic interest, give gifts, or ask personal questions. Next is throwing. Um, the female gamer's teammates may intentionally lose the game or quote-unquote feed her to the opponents. Because female gamers are, females are stereotypically considered to be weak or submissive, they are also perceived to be needing assistance or boosting when playing. Or in the Philippines, we call it um, the term pabuhat. This undermines the true abilities of the female gamers. Unfortunately, discrimination goes beyond the gaming match. Female gamers have expressed their uncomfortable experiences of being trash-talked through private messages or even stalked and were threatened. At the onset of discrimination, female gamers have multiple mechanisms to cope, like accepting or resisting these stereotypes. Because of the large cases of harassment in gaming, there is a common tendency to avoid retaliation due to fear. Female gamers may experience tilting when they are distracted, thus affecting their gameplay, or they may also choose to take a short break from gaming or exit the gaming space indefinitely. Majority of the female gamers, however, are completely aware of their marginalized position and this increasing consciousness results to the different patterns of resistance in the face of discrimination. 
For Deutsch's undoing gender theory, the onset of discrimination may become a site for resistance, and female gamers may dismantle gender barriers, behave in, a, behave in opposition to the stereotypes, or engage in collect, collective action. One pattern of resistance identified is talking back, wherein female gamers confront and call out on others' discriminatory actions, which is opposed to the demure and submissive stereotype. Our female respondents also call it trash talking, but instead of throwing insults, they usually provoke or intimidate. For example, they reply, so what? Or they say, how is this even funny? Rooting from their own experiences, female gamers also found the need to stand up for fellow female gamers being discriminated against. They do this by reassuring them or again talking back on behalf of them. Next, they also express the act of disproving discrimination by deploying their skills. A sense of pride and empowerment are felt whenever they end up being MVPs of the game. As an underrepresented group in the gaming space, female gamers are particularly sensitive to a sense of not belonging. They recognize that their minority status only contributes to a cycle of unfulfilled belonging demands. Thus, there is a common narrative for joining girl gamer communities. These are exclusive safe spaces that provide empowerment and a sense of belongingness. Our respondents express that they often find their teammates here. For our recommendations of the study, um, we encouraged all respondents to engage in discussions on change in the gaming space for it to become safer and more inclusive. The responses pointed to the significance of structural changes in the gaming industry so as to remove the need to contest in the first place and for inclusivity to trickle down to individual behavior. Furthering the undoing gender theory and with the help of our respondents' suggestions rooted in their experiences, our study proposes the following recommendations. Firstly, seeing that most of the female characters are made with more provocative and hypersexualized characteristics, it would be better to create more gender fluid costumes and skins. Skill sets as well across all characters should also foster equal positions with more female characters taking on offensive roles. Aside from the characters, the study also recommends that game developers restructure the system of censorship, monitoring, commendation, and reporting. It is preferred for gamers to be able to recommend or not recommend others based on their behaviors. The reporting system should also be reformed as it is found to be inefficient. Majority of the female participants expressed how collecting evidence of harassment is almost impossible since it requires a recording of the event happening while playing and in private chats where discrimination beyond the game occurs, they are not allowed by the developers to be used as evidence. Relevant to the system of censorship and reporting, there is a need to reinforce stricter punishments with regard to misconduct in the Philippines, especially in tournaments. Sanctions vary across countries, and as recently observed, Filipino esports organizations do not sanction misdemeanors seriously as compared to other countries. As seen here, a Filipino esports player on the left was only given a two week ban for harassment and homophobia. While on the right, um, a few of these Singaporean players were banned from competing in tournaments for at least one to two years for doing similar misconduct. The study acknowledges the rise of inclusive tournaments, but it is also noticeable that there is a major lack of broadcasting and sponsorship efforts. These are critical avenues for shedding light on important issues and also influencing aspiring players. More cybercrime laws or policies should also be implemented to improve the gaming space. Through a bottom-up approach, game developers and the government must work hand-in-hand -hand and invite players to engage in discourse and research into their experiences in order to find targeted solutions. In the area of research, it would benefit the goal of inclusivity in further studies to gather more data from other MMO games and also look into how discriminatory patterns vary over time and how coping techniques adapt. It might also build on this work by looking into the experiences of other non-traditional player groups to determine if they suffer the same issues as women and how they deal with them. There are also cultural differences in other games, in other game cultures with the dominance of Western studies on this topic, the researchers encourage uh, fellow researchers of other cultures to embark in similar studies, especially if, from places where gaps in literature exist. After examining the gaming space and the female gamers journey towards with, towards, within, and beyond it, it can be seen that women are capable of resisting and dealing with cases of discrimination. However, none of these strategies may be considered a final solution. They are rather band-aid solutions to the problem rather than a cure. 
Thus, shifting the gaming space as a whole would be a more effective way of bringing more diverse players positively and long-term into the gaming community. And though more female gamers are already exerting their efforts to resist discrimination, ultimately creating a safe space and inclusive gaming space for them and fellow marginalized gamer groups to remove the need for resistance still serves to be the real game changer. That's it for our presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to our presenters, Kyla and Gab. Now we would turn over the floor to Mr. JP Dalupang, who would be mentioning his questions, and then it will be immediately followed up by Miss Jessie Claudio, who will be reading the comments and questions from uh, Miss Emily Roque Sarmiento. Thank you, Miss Cherry. So uh, I'd like to congratulate Kyla and Gab, no, and uh, and I, I, I I'm sure I can speak for Miss Emily, no. Uh, it's very good that you were able to expand from our proposal, no, discussions during the proposal presentation to expand just a little bit more on exploring some of the nuances of what happens uh, with these cases of discrimination, and also how do the female gamers. Um, uh, uh, respond, no. Um, a, a couple of things, muna, no. I was, uh, I was wondering, because you, you, I, I would suggest na, because I think the original suggestion was to include male gamers, right, in the interview, and you accommodated that, and we're very happy that you did. However, I wish you could also have highlighted, you know, from the point of view of the uh, of the male gamers. I may have missed it, no. But maybe ask: Did they say anything about why do why do they do it? You know, what are the motivations of doing it? What do they get out of it? You no, know, I, I I wonder. No, you can you can answer it uh, uh, later. But uh, yun, yun yung una ko. Parang hindi ko masyadong naririnig yung bosses ng lalaki. Not because you know, <laughs> not because I'm I'm a guy. You no, know, but it's more along the lines of actually seeing uh, that point of view as well. Uh, and then second, I think um, you raised no several important points. Yung sinasabi natin na yung coping mechanisms, no yung yung uh, uh, yung ibat ibang konsepto na inattach nyo doon. Um, but I was wondering then if you could maybe find something else in your data that would uh, give you a little bit more nuancing. What do I mean by that? No, no one thing in the sense na, for example, yung sinabi ninyo yung coping mechanism would just be responding, so what? Or why is that even funny? No, Would there be other things kaya na mas malalim nilang ginagawa? Kasi, for example, yung uh, sinasabi ninyo, I found that very interesting na minsan sinasadya, no? deliberately nagpapatalo yung team. No? Is there anything na ginagawa naman kaya ng girls? No, when they feel unsafe, aside from just saying na so what or how is that even funny? <laughs> May ginagawa ba sila dun sa mga I don't I don't know the technology behind it, but can you do something to weaken your teammates or to make them appear, you know, stupid in the game? I don't know. Yun lang. Parang yung part na yun, I think it will it will just highlight because with, with the way that in in your paper it is presented, no, um, and I think you can do this uh, under advisement with Mrs. Jesse. We don't want to uh, show, kasi yung unang basa ko and yung pangalawang pagbabasa ko ngayon ng paper ninyo, I, sana hindi natin ma-highlight na very victimized yung, yung girls. no? Kasi I think you highlighting things like, oh, you can, yung suggestion nyo nga, yung sa skins, di ba, na pwedeng gamitin, it's actually an avenue for empowerment. It's an avenue to assert themselves. So siguro yun lang sa discussion, yung, pangalawang, yung pangatlong suggestion ko is, uh, let us project more the opportunities for the girls to empower themselves and just go against all of these sexist, no? Hindi nga lang siya gender, it's a sexist process that some of the gamers are doing. Yun. And then, uh, sige, yun lang munang tatlo. So, una munang tanong ko, yung voice ng, ng boys, anong nangyari? Sige, go ahead. Um, we actually have a lot of narratives also from the male school, but I think it was also in our part to uh, miss including them, especially because there was our data was really complex one, really 
marami po talagang narratives. Cool. Um, uh, maybe we'll, we'll include this po in revising our manuscript. But at the same time po, yes, in answering your question, male gamers that we interviewed, though they did not um, discriminate them, uh, they, they didn't do the actions themselves. They spoke in behalf of other people they knew who do it. And they would always attribute it to toxic masculinity po. Um, that's what they always say. That's the common theme ng toxic nga daw po. Or they have this term say, they have this term saying cancer po. Y- yan yung term nila. Na cancer, cancer is daw po yung ganyan behavior. And they always attribute it na uh, they don't think female gamers have to play in those multiplayer games. Although my games po, called casual games, wherein female gamers also, they also play there. It's less competitive. And you can play alone, but and they think the female gamers belong there. So that's their reasoning for as to why there's this discrimination on going because they think there are other places for female gamers to to do leisure. Po. Thank you. Um, Kyla, that's very important because that supports the claim of your female gamers. So <laughs> hindi siya parang ay kasi siguro babae ka, that's why you feel that way. But I think if you include a little bit of that statement from the male gamers that would then validate that the experience is not something that that you know kasi some people might say oh baka naman overly sensitive lang or something lalo na it's not a face to face affair diba it's virtual but if you include those things it further strengthens the argument that there is really that no okay tapos yung pangalawa natin so yung una is about uh, ano nga ba yan is about the voice of the the males and then yung pangalawa is Uh, mayroon bang ginagawa na iba pang mas pailalim na, you know, very subtle but can be very uh, major ang effect doon sa gaming that the women can do? Um, Ayan, go, Gary. Go, Gary. Go, Gary. Uh, for the, in terms of kung may mas malalim po na ginagawa, from what they answered po, there weren't necessarily forms of throwing or uh, parang killing off their own uh, teammates. It's more of really just standing up for themselves vocally mm-hmm. or really showing off their skills as mentioned in majority of the quotes yes. that we presented po. That's, um, that's their way of resisting po. And also, I guess, pwede na rin po isama yung fact na they report the players yes. who, uh, uh, who discriminate them or harass them in any way. But the unfortunate um, thing is that Nothing happens when it's reported. So parang wala po talaga nangyayari in that case. But in terms of what they do, it's it doesn't go any deeper than talking back and showing off their skills. So it's not, there's no way in a negative way na they're retaliating. Hmm. Wala ba gabi yung tipong they form their allies with the other male gamers na parang may sympathizer sila and then they work together at least hindi naman you know hindi openly but they work together and these male gamers would say you no know, they they acknowledge na yung ganong classing behavior is not acceptable and so um i'm interested nga din din yung kasi masyado na banggit yun if within the gaming space itself meron bang nangyayaring self control within the within the game parang sinasabi oy pare wag naman ganyan or you know what you're saying is do they do they get reprimands from other members of the gaming space other than just the females? Uh, na- yes, sir. From the interviews with the male players, well, they, they would um, present experiences where they would personally uh, apprehend any sexist male players or any, male, any player in general who um, presents sexist uh, comments or behaviors. Um, so in terms of if they go in tandem, parang they work together with the female player to do better in the game. It wasn't explicitly said, but I guess it can be um, assumed that they played the game normally even without the sexist player participating. Thank you, Gab. I think yun lang, no? baka pwede nyo idagdag yun doon. I-highlight din siya. Kasi nga, yun yung sa third point ko doon sa paper. Let's not ano lang, dwell on the part na parang victimized talaga yung females. Although, yes, there are victims of these unfair practices. But as you have already mentioned, they're not powerless. No, they, they have the capacity and they're able to build alliances within the game. They have sympathizers. Now, whether or not, or not those sympathizers would do something 
beyond no what is being being done now that's another quest that's another story so, but at least if you can establish that then you can uh, in your paper you can put out no those notions na na ano na totoong nangyayari ito it is it is experienced by the females the males acknowledge it the rest of the community finds it to be offensive to be unacceptable and there's there are these little things happening within the gaming space that actually tells you na uh, this is not something that they want. No? And siguro last point ko na lang, when you do your recommendations, kasi you started kasi with the recommendations on uh, the gaming uh, platform itself, eh, no? yung reporting, yung, yung resolution ng mga, ng mga, ano tawag dyan, ng mga complaints, no? mga grievances. Ang suggestion ko lang, Maybe you can start first na lang yung recommendations with the research recommendations. No, is you be, at least this is based on your manuscript. Let's start the recommendations muna doon sa research. Ano pa yung mga sa tingin niyo na pwede pang ma-explore, ano pa yung mga dapat tignan given doon sa inyong findings. And then that's the time when you go into recommendations for the industry itself. Ayun lang para lang kasi no binabasa ko yung manuscript parang Ah, okay, nag-uusap na tayo about the industry kasi sinahanap ko yung research. Ando siya sa dulo. So, yun yung suggestion ko lang. Ibalik. And then, last, last, last na to. When you write your final paper, kasi this is such an interesting paper, siguro within your first two pages, no, I know it's at the introduction, but you know, maybe when you write the abstract, uh, in those first two pages, write exactly what excites you about this research? What did you find out that really excited you? Para pag binasa siya ng reader, cool, nakita nila to. And then they'll go further in and say, ano kaya yung data nila that that made them say itong mga ganitong conclusions? Because like what you said, um, and I'd like to congratulate you for taking on this challenge kasi this is the field that needs more exploration at least in the field of sociology. And you mentioned earlier it really caught me you know, when you mentioned in, in your paper in your presentation na sometimes the filipino gamers they would just go into other country country servers tama ba ako? and they end up playing with other nationalities that's a very big reflection on filipino culture and you can say something based on your findings na bakit kaya pag pumupunta ba doon and i mean you don't have to answer this now but just thinking out loud Ibig sabihin ba sa ibang country, sa ibang context, hindi nangyayari. So yun. So please highlight the best findings that you have para this paper will get more attention because I think it deserves a lot. Thank you, Miss Jessie. Thank you, Pa. Thanks, Thank you. Sir. Thank and you. congrats, Gabby and Kyla. So um, si Emily can't make it to the colloquium this afternoon, pero sinend niya yung uh, top comments niya, although meron siyang specific comments in the paper itself, which I think she will send you later on. Pero um, for now, yung comments niya, um, number one, um, highlights, siguro not in the form of question, um, and maybe this is a suggestion. No? Um, in the paper, um, you write what is unique and significant about the three games that you chose for the study. Um, so especially in relation to your topic, which is on gender inequalities in the gaming space. No? So parang are they known for... Um, certain negative gender dynamics or interaction? Do certain inequalities and forms of resistance exist in these um, three games? No? Kaya nyo gusto silang uh, pag-aralan. So maybe just flesh that out in, um, in, your, in your introduction. Parang significance or um, para ba? parang how you selected the, the three games um, compared to all the other games out there. No? Um, and then maybe... To, yung question niya no yung number one is on the methods or the findings no um so na notice niya that all your male participants are students and your female participants are all employed so would a balance between the two be better in terms of seeing employed male experience versus unemployed or student female experiences and at the same time tinatanong din niya yun bang um, because they are different ba students yung mga lalaki and employed yung mga babae won't this affect or have a possible bias in terms of how um, employed females will negotiate patterns of resistance versus males. So maybe yun muna. Um, I can answer that, Pam. In terms of collecting the data, we didn't really um, notice that the majority of the male players were students. 
uh, we didn't intend for it to be that way. It's mostly because um, when we were collecting participants for female gamers, we had these spaces like Facebook groups catered talaga to female gamers who they just, uh, they're all there. And it's easily available for Kyla to go on the group and post. Um, that way it's completely random. Po. But in terms of game, um, collecting male gamers, po, we really have to result to referrals and asking our friends or students or acquaintances if they know anybody who could participate in our study. Um, because there wasn't a specific Facebook group or um, social media group where we could easily post and have them um, approach us personally. Um, and then in terms of um, if it would change the uh, dynamic of the data, if it's if having more professional female gamers, being professional in as in older and less and more student males, I think it would considering that um, professionals in the workspace would already have a sense of experience with um, discrimination, and then they could bring that experience to the gaming space, and so it's easier for them to retaliate as as opposed to. Um, the experiences of male student gamers, but so we will we will take into take that into consideration Bob, for the final paper, and we'll be sure to discuss that in the limitations. Right. So, parang dahil siya dun sa sampling ano kaya like it, it was an unintended na meron kayong parang na exclusively students yung males and exclusively employed yung females but maybe um our recommendation siguro um is to mention that limitation no na parang while this is a variable of interest in describing your respondents or your participants in the study it was completely unintentional and therefore acknowledge that there's a possible bias no um kasi hindi balance yung um yung respondent yung status or employment status nung uh, nung respondent ninyo And then, um, do you also have data now on game, number of gaming years or experience of playing uh, in terms of, um, and, and parang how it relates to crafting certain strategies for resistance? So I'm um, assuming this is for female respondents. So parang may effect daw ba yung gano'ng katagal na silang naglalaro or yung gaming experience nila and um, yung kanilang capacity to change the game. Kasi ba game changers yung inyong title. Um, for us, po, the experience also matters. Not so much for the years or the length or yung frequency of gaming nila. Like they, if they play every day or twice a day, or thrice, thrice a week, twice a week, because um, the gaming space is complex. Po, and it takes um, time to get used to. With the features, it's very uh, the features, the um, the language, the jargons po, in the gaming space, and also the dynamics when playing with a team. So we think for those female gamers who had who were more frequent in gaming, um, since they have more experience and they were also more aware of what's happening in the during a match po, and they also have more experience in teaming up with other with other players po, this this gave them more opportunity to figure out or craft out patterns of resistance po. and they also mentioned naman po na um, in in defending other female players, those that they defend were mostly the new ones, po, the new gamers. So yeah, that's why we conclude that the experience also matters. Po. Okay. Sige. And then maybe last question, since we were talking about your title, which is Game Changers. No? Sabi ni Emily, what do you mean by Game Changers in the context of your study? Were they able to change certain practices or worldviews about female gamers? Certain changes in inequalities, movements, or actions form? Uh, and how did female Filipino gamers become game changers exactly? Um, in the concept, the concept of game changers, po, they mainly mainly focus on the patterns of resistance that um, emerged in our study. Um, they were able to find ways to break these gender stereotypes or um, dismantle dismantle these gender stereotypes, and they also paved the way for other female gamers to um, to flourish in the gaming space, po. Um, in terms of patterns, po, before talking back wasn't really a common thing, but now when talking back is becoming more common, as what a female gamer said, na um, nababaguhan yung male gamers pag nagtotalk back ni female gamers, and 
it's sort of changing the conversation as to um, in accordance with the demure stereotypes of females for, or the submissive stereotypes. So that's one way that they change um, the game for. And then in terms of boomets for, um, as what I've seen in the Facebook communities, they have these empowering spaces and they also advocate for um, certain causes, especially with regards to female gamers for. And also they have, um, they have these bonding events for, and at the same time, they're very open to um, discussing with game developers. Actually, the moderators of the, the gaming community that I joined for, they were able to talk with um, game, certain game developers of, of, a, of an online game. And I think they're in the talks of, um, I think, a, female, a new female character, if, if I remember correctly. But, so that's um, a movement that I can pick off. But, and then also, I think we can share, Gabby, that our female players also change the game in terms of achievements. Like one, one female gamer, po, she's a Mobile Legends player. Oh, okay, sorry, wrap it up. Um, she was the first Filipina female gamer po, to top a global gaming mode in Mobile Legends. And she saw in the community that because of that, um, a lot of other female gamers had the confidence to enter that gaming mode, which was um, commonly entered only by male gamers. Ayon. So maybe, um, so these are good um, explanations. No? So maybe the recommendation there is to make this more explicit in the conclusion part of your manuscript para nagtatay in yung title ninyo and the overall um, parang parang findings conclusion ninyo um, dun sa, sa study ninyo. Um, and sorry, last one, na last point, not uh, not a question but a point, no? Um, maybe para susugan yung point ni JP uh, a while ago about yung servers, yung the, the Filipino gamers go to foreign servers um, instead of playing in the Filipino servers because um, they experience um, more discrimination in, with Filipino uh, gamers, ano? Um, so si Emily is also Point, uh, parang maybe point for consideration ninyo to explain how exactly the foreign servers are more parang gender sensitive or gender responsive than the Filipino uh, gaming uh, servers no and kung paano yon nalilink dun sa decision nga to participate more in the foreign servers um, versus the Filipino uh, service the Philippine service so so yun lang thank you very much Kyla and Gabby and congratulations back to you Cherry Thank you so much uh, to our presenters, Kyla and Gabby. Congratulations. And thank you to our reviewers, uh, Mr. Dalupang and Ms. Roque Sarmento. All right. Finally, we proceed with our last presenter, um, Ms. Kyla David and Ms. Pam uh, Eliazar, who will be presenting their work entitled Taho, <laughs> uh, a case study of the informal sector through an examination of the Taho Enterprise, supervised by Dr. Nina Leviste and with us uh, via Zoom, their reviewers, uh, Dr. Lisa Lim and Mr. John Abletis. All right. Take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. We are Kyla David and Pamela Yazar, along with our thesis advisor, Dr. Mika Nino Leviste, presenting our thesis research, Taho, a case study of the informal sector through an examination of the Taho enterprise. Take it away, Pam. So, street vendors or peddlers are a common set in developing countries. In particular, the Philippines boasts of a burgeoning informal sector wherein a pervasive street vending industry belongs. As we all know, the Philippines is home to the famous Divisoria Market and peddlers that throng plazas and streets nationwide. There are no officially recognized statistical tools that can accurately count the number of street vendors here, but the 2017 Labor Force Survey estimated 15.6 million laborers to be working under the informal sector, which was 38% of the total working population of the country at the time. It had a total contribution of 5 trillion pesos to the Philippines GDP in 2017, which is re reflective of the immense impact that the sector holds on the country's economy. So this street vending can be an adaptive strategy for the urban poor. It allows them to work as self-employed individuals with a stronger sense of agency and autonomy. Despite not having licenses to sell, they distribute legal goods mostly produced and manufactured by factories in the formal sector. Street vending then becomes a choice born out of the individual's agency to pursue it as a legitimate career option. Next slide, please. So in terms of the actual products that these people sell, a good example that's commonly sold in the Philippines is Taho. 
It's a snack that's believed to have healed from Chinese origins, but has since lodged its way into the intricacies of Filipino culture, especially as these days one may find taho almost anywhere. Even formal establishments like mall franchises have incorporated these into their menus, indicating that regardless of class, there is a strong market for taho in the Philippines. Using the Taha Enterprise as a case study then can serve as an avenue to gain deeper insight to the informal economy, its relation to the formal economy, and the actors that comprise it. Through examining the structures, meanings, and interactions behind Taha peddling and producing, the study, the study thus aims to answer the overarching question, how is the Taha Enterprise organized into a social system? With this, our main objectives are to understand organized pattern behavior or, or activities that comprise street vending through an examination of the Taha Enterprise, to provide a sociological analysis of street vending through the lens of Anthony Gidden's structuration theory, to highlight the Taha enterprise as contributors of the local economy, to examine uh, the interconnection between the informal and formal economy by understanding the roles both Taha vendors and producers play, and to challenge dominant views and representations of street vendors and vendors. In order to answer our questions and achieve our objectives, we must first understand street vending through the context of its structures and agencies. A guiding theory to understanding street vending as a social system is by using structuration theory by Anthony Giddens. Structuration theory argues that agency and structure must be approached with duality that cannot be separated from one another. Agency is implicated in structure and structure is involved in agency. With this, a social system must produce as an institutional reality, reproduce or change in coherent ways because individual action is always already patterned by structure, yet is simultaneously affirmed or changed by agencies within that system. But let us first define structure. Structures are rules and patterns that are created through agency, thus making it both constraining and enabling. To elaborate on this, Giddens provides three kinds of structure in his framework, signification or meaning-making, domination or control of power, and legitimation or moral order. In the context of street vending, it can be argued that structures such as the relationships that street vendors cultivate over time creates a social system. The study assumes these four types of street vending relationships from the literature. First is the vendor custom relationships that are constructed within the day to day interactions of the street vendors and their customers as they provide affordable goods that cannot be offered both by the pharma sector and the government. Earning patrons or sukis. Second is the vendor space relationship with which is the carefully constructed space that vendors have established, which determines the activity patterns of shoppers and producers. Third is the vendor-vendor relationships that were formed as a result of vendors adapting by creating their own norms and laws that would guide their economic activity. Lastly, there are vendor-state relationships which define the contention between the local government authorities and the street vendors. These relationships then highlight how actors create and form systems that facilitate street vending as both social and economic activities. However, only examining these relationships remains inadequate as social actors themselves have their own agencies that allow for these systems to be formed. A social system is not complete without the combined agencies that instantiate these structures into practice. For agency, according to Giddens, despite being free to enact change, agents are still bounded by structure, which influences how one acts. However, one can still play a vital role in shaping and influencing their circumstances. As such, structure becomes a reflection of agency's power to influence their lived environment. With this, taho vendors are considered hango or dependent sellers who obtain goods by buying the raw materials of a product from a source that handles the capital needed for selling. They have their own sense of autonomy, though, that allows them to mark up their prices and choose their own work hours and routes. Their agency also allows them to strategize with external factors by using strategies of resistance, which Asif Bayat calls quiet encroachment, unobtrusive actions that aim to attain basic needs like employment. This includes picking areas with less security and sending signals of warning if an authority figure is coming. Lastly, vendors commonly come across customers that, that attempt to bargain the prices of their products which persuades them to offer discounts. As for negotiating with authorities, vendors commonly offer gangs and or authorities bribes for protection and lack supervision, respectively. This interrelationship between selling, street, space, consumers, and the state highlights the complexities of street vending space born from a social system and the agency of the individuals. As such, the study would cater to these narratives by conducting interviews and visual ethnography, both formal and informal, to shed light on the experience of the informal economy by using perspectives of the Taho vendors and their ways to adapt, self-govern, and even contend with these structures as they perform their activities as a case study. As such, our study aims to answer the main research questions 
question, how is the Toho enterprise organized into a social system? Upon this, the study would highlight how systems of street vending as an economic activity are both influenced, shaped, challenged, and reproduced by both agency and structure. Although it should be noted that some of our limitations include having only one study site. With these findings are not intended to generalize the context that a larger sample of Toho vendors may be in. The site was also chosen out of convenience as the owners are relatives of one of the researchers. However, we did consistently keep objectivity and anonymity in mind with the participants. In consideration of the pandemic, we were also limited to very brief field work. One of us was allowed to go and we ended up going doing a visual ethnography for three days instead, in addition to in-depth interviews. Other personal factors like gender and class were also considered in analyzing data, but were not deeply examined throughout the study. So for structures, we must first understand the history, perception, rules, and relationships within and beyond the Taha enterprise. So the factory has been operating since 2003 and was established along the streets of Binyan, Laguna. It was originally built after a Taha factory in San Pedro, Laguna had closed down. A vendor named El Cadio approached the retired owner, owner Tom to adopt the displaced vendors who had nowhere to go. As such, Tom transformed the vacant lots within his compound and proceeded to build the Taha factory as well as the houses for the vendors. For this study, we interviewed nine Taha vendors whose profiles are outlined in the table. Participants describe Taha as a healthy and affordable snack that is stapled in our palate. Nuances and deeper meaning, however, are observed by the researchers. For the factory owner, their Taha enterprise is perceived as an aid for the vendors. Hence, the motivation for the business is defined as an act of kindness rather than an economic venture. For the, for the vendors, Taha is perceived as their way of life. Relationships are also built within these activities, making Taha an essential part of their lives apart from just being a main source of income. Having this said, all stakeholders share a common appreciation for Taha because it is their bread and butter. With this, the process of structuration takes place. As they share mutual meanings, they form signification structures, which refers to the production of meaning by the actors. While Taho is simply a beverage for the normal Filipino, meanings embedded by both the owners and vendors are unique given to the context. So there are minimal rules within the compound. Both owners also have different management styles. The vendors pledged their loyalty to the management indirectly due to utang na loob because they only paid 20 pesos per day for their housing. Although, since the compound is owned by the factory owners, it still creates a structure of control or domination, power relationship between them. They do not have formal contracts to legitimize their relationship, but living in the compound entails, buying, entails the vendors to buy from factory daily regardless of the hot quality. The vendor-owner relationship, however, is mutually beneficial. There is mutual respect because vendors are thankful for the cheap pabahay that the owners provide, whereas owners are appreciative of the vendor's continuous patronage of their taho. As trust is formed, it is expected that the vendors adhere to their minimal rules and that the owners are reliable in times of need. In David's words, dapat nagbibigayan. With this, the structure of legitimation takes place where the norm of trust and camaraderie becomes the moral order or standard in acting accordingly in the compound, considering that they do not have contracts or written agreements to legally, legally bind the system. Breaking this trust and camaraderie can result in sanctions such as expulsion from the area, conflict with the owners, other vendors, and apprehension by the police. As the Taha vendors paddle the streets, they form these types of relationships. First is the vendor-customer relationships. The most common response we got from our participants is their value for their suki. A suki must meet these two criteria. First, they must frequently purchase the ho, and second, they must have a close personal relationships with the vendor apart from the usual transactional exchanges. Therefore, a suki is not just a valued customer, but is also a social capital. Vendors are able to rely in, on their suki in times of need as they both have shared loyalties with each other. As shared by David, suki pa mismo nagsusumbong na may dumadating na ibang vendor which shows that Sukis are loyal to their vendors because of their relationships with them starting childhood. The vendors then emphasize on the importance of pakikisama and pakikipagkapwa tao in their profession because it is the key to having more loyal patrons. But then, second is the vendor-vendor relationships. Within and beyond Taho Factory X, the camaraderie between vendors is strong as they are able to rely on each other. Vendors avoid taking up spaces or quests of each other as a sign of respect. At times, encroaching on one space is met with hostility. However, the participating vendors share that they let these new vendors in the route because they empathize with them. Another sign of camaraderie within vendors is sharing of capital materials by offering rides, sharing arnibal, and swapping items. Moreover, vendors also train other vendors. 
old vendors vouch for new vendors because Sookies are more likely to buy from these new vendors, unlike when a random new Tahoe vendor would frequent their place. This corroborates Aguilar's assertion that commodity sources are usually introduced to vendors by their family, friends, and colleagues, thereby building trust with customers and other vendors easier. These practices maintain that street vendors uh, that as street vendors are not part of the formal economy, there are no regulating bodies that would establish control and order for the trading, trading that takes place. As such, street vendors adapt by creating their own, own norms and laws that would guide their economic activity by adopting daily strategies that bank on mutual respect and camaraderie. For vendor space relationships, despite not having any formal stake to claim these spaces, there is an understanding among the hub vendors that the place is off limits if it's already been claimed by another. Even customers recognize and abide by the system, refusing to buy from vendors if they live on another's established space. As such, the lack of contracts and papers to officiate their claim on a place isn't seen as a hindrance because spaces continue to be associated with vendors because of the history and the relationships that they build within. So in place of money and other material things, spaces like subdivisions are seen as pamana or inheritances that they can give off to their children. So despite merely peddling along the street, vendors have built foundations and relationships strong enough to consider them part of spaces that institutions as intimate as families welcome and consider them to belong therein. Space therefore holds deeper meaning in that it serves as a domain that creates cultures within which people are linked together. Their impermanence in a space ironically leads to an allotted place for them, helping produce systems that they build, participate in, and manage along with other actors such as customers and authorities. As for vendors' state uh, relationship, the vendors share the difficulties they experience in performing their work. For one, heavy rains hamper them from, make, from making sales, leading them to give away their Tahoe for free so they can avoid wastage. The vendors also experience discrimination as Noelle started working as a vendor at 13, shared how his classmates used to tease him Taho. As Bob relayed, he also experienced having a gun pointed at him for, just for entering someone's puesto. Um, so this lack, um, they also lack social welfare and pension plans. And um, this is attrib attributed to their pessimism and distrust towards the state. And in the same way, none of the participants believe in unions either. So they showed more trust towards themselves and the producers of the factory. The participants also enumerated different types of discard in selling taho. While older vendors like Ryan tried that building trust with their customers was the way, younger vendors preferred to be more creative by using megaphones and playing recordings of them shouting taho. Other types of discarta include bribing mall guards to let them sell outside malls and signaling one another if a guard was about to ticket them. These may be attributed to what Bayat calls quiet encroachment. Furthermore, most of the participants consist consistently convey their contentment with their jobs as it allows them to determine their work hours, giving them a chance to spend more time with their families, friends, and church communities. Additionally, the factory manager is a female. She explained how the women in the compound buy soya beans from the taho producers, though in place of making taho, they use these to make sokwa or tofu instead. As such, though the compound is known primarily for producing taho, the vendors' wives are still able to determine their autonomy by utilizing the materials available to make something of their own. In terms of aspirations, Joey, the current owner, aims to expand the business, and Tom, the previous owner, hopes to convert the compound into a renting service but refuses to do so for the welfare of the vendors. Both also hope to see um, the vendors get social security. Um, vendors echo their desire to have their kids finish school, corroborating the not finding that the primary inspiration of vendors in working is their family. With this, as Aguilar pointed to the high rate of enrollment of the children of Hangwa sellers, the data we've gathered indicated the same as some shared stories about their children graduating from high school and or college. The Taha Enterprise then is organized into a social system as the lasting relationships between the owners, vendors, managers, suki, and customers create regular social practices that are incorporated into their daily lives. Apart from the economic activity, norms and values such as structure of trust and camaraderie are upheld in all of the relationships within and beyond the compound to self-govern this unregulated, illegal, and informal economic activity. Although despite operating under these structures, the hub vendors themselves enable and constrain the existing social system as active agents who regularly negotiate their way through these structures in order achieve, to achieve their aspirations. With this, a duality between structure and agency is highlighted. Trust and camaraderie acts as a moral code for the agencies of the Taha enterprise as part of the informal economy. They are, however, also the ones who have the power to define, shape, and change this norm of trust and camaraderie with one another as they instantiate this into their lives within and beyond Taha enterprise X. As such, the relational pattern that emergency street vending as an activity creates its own space that enriches and shapes urban life. It is systematically organized so much so that the Taho vending is still a viable economic pursuit for a number of Filipinos until this day. 
We'd like to end our presentation with a quote of one of our participants. Basta masipag ka lang, meron naman sigurong mararating. Although it is worth noting that kasipagan in this sense is not just urgently selling taho. It is also cultivating relationships and friendships in their community spaces and with their suki. And with that, we end our presentation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Pam and Kyla. Now we turn over the floor to our reviewers, Dr. Lisa Lim and Mr. John Abletis. John, would you like to go first or should I go first? <laughs> <laughs> Ayun. <laughs> Okay, so um, first I want to congratulate the group for um, finishing the project. Ayun, so um, maganda naman yung papel. Um, may mga comments lang ako, konti lang naman siya, siguro superficial lang siya. Um, yung sa, pasensya <coughs> na na pausa ko, kanina po ako discuss um, So first, um, dun sa discussion ng theory, um, para sa akin, um, uh, how should I say this? Yun, may nakalagay kasi uh, note ko na parang be careful in using terms kasi parang um, there are portions na um, the term social system and social uh, the term social system and structure although both are distinct in um, the structuration theory of kittens parang na, na, nagagamit siya interchangeably eh, medyo nakakalito siya kapag kapag binabasa natin yun so yun be careful in using those terms um Tapos may nandito pa ako dito parang sabi sa page 12. Um, it is crucial to identify the integration between agency, vendors, and structures, state, street, economy, etc. as both actors that have different functions. So parang um, medyo narito rin ako rito kasi parang um, guidance has a certain idea of social system. Yun yung established um, social relationship, system of social relationships, routines, etc. Et Pagkatapos may binabanggit kayo na function. So parang Um, nalilito ako kung functional analysis ba ito o yung kay Giddens. So yun, may, may mga distinction kasi pagdating doon. At yun, medyo nakakalito nga siya. And um, tapos pa paano siya natawag na actors din sa page 12. Tapos um, he also mentioned na yun nga, um, um, thankful ako kasi parang in-adapt niya yung, yung sinabi ko noon na parang, na parang um, this is a case study approach. Okay, so... Um, these were sabi nyo, uh, these were semi structured to allow them to lead the discussions and provide the researchers accurate and authentic data parang yung term kasi na accurate and authentic data um medyo ano yan how should they say this kapag objectivist ka okay walang problema yan pero kapag constructivist ka questionable yan yung yung term na accurate and authentic data kasi pwedeng ano yan eh pwedeng mabago siya depende sa panahon depende sa interviewer depende sa Uh, mar maraming pwede. So, I don't know kung um, uh, what epistemological position are you coming from to, to, to claim na accurate and authentic data yun. So, yun. Be, be careful lang siya. And then, um, um, you mentioned visual ethnography. Buti na lang nilagay niyo dun sa mga slides yun na may mga pictures kasi doon sa document wala. So, parang, parang um, I was expecting doon sa document. Tapos na kayo mga picture nila rito kasi visual ethnography daw. So, um, how did you analyze your data? Um, Ano ba siya? Paano siya inantithematic ba siya? Or what kind of analysis did you do? Um, tapos, how did you generate the four relationships in your research? Kasi parang dun sa introduction, um, so parang ang, ang pagkakaintindi ko dun sa introduction, you identify those relationships based on the review of related literature. Tapos pagdating na dun sa analysis, kumanap kayo ng mga statements that would um, um, uh, corroborate or support those, um, those relationships that you found in the literature. Kaya lang kasi ang naging problema doon sa tingin ko may mga statements doon na parang hindi nag-fit doon sa heading or doon sa do sa relationship so for example uh, may binanggit kayo dito about uh, sabi niyo dito some soupies grow tired of eating taho so they would spend weeks not purchasing from the vendors pero yung statement na yun nilagay niyo doon sa vendor state relationship so parang asan yun doon parang i was um, i was looking for um state actors tapos um Doon sa vendor-vendor relationship, parang um, in-emphasize ninyo doon yung term na pakikisama at saka pakikipagkapwa. Pero as I was reading the narrative, parang ang mas naisip ko doon ay hindi pakikisama at pakikipagkapwa, kundi yung turfing. Parang nawala yung, yung, yung theme na yon 
yung turfing, yung parang pag-establish ng territory. Kaya nga parang may, nab- may nabasa ko rin na parang may nabaril kasi parang pumasok siya doon sa teritoryo ng isa. Pagkatapos parang 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 intruder siya. So parang hindi ko nakita doon sa analysis yung yung turfing or yung pag-establish ng territory. I think ko that that is a salient um that is a salient theme. Tapos doon sa um doon sa space vendor relationship um parang old vendors view spaces pa man. Okay, fine. Okay, so medyo nawawala yung idea ng turfing. Um, kasi yung tanong ko dito, how do Taho vendors secure their territory? Kasi may binanggikirit na newly built subdivisions are also closely anticipated by the vendors to see who can um, stake their claims, other claim there first. So, okay yun sa akin, magandang, uh, magandang insight yung buti na kuha niya. So, parang it would be better also if you have a subsection um, dun sa section na yan um, that would narrate kung ano yung process na pinagdadaanan ng mga Taho vendors to, see, uh, to, to secure that area. Um, tapos, Um, ayun, so yun rin, sa state vendor relationship, may nakalagay itong sa competition competition with commercial brands such, such as Vitamix. So parang inisip ko lang bakit siya nasa, bakit siya nasa vendor-state relationship. Kasi parang, parang pwede naman kasi kayo na mag-generate ng categories or pwede kayo na mag-generate ng mga teams and not necessarily yung nakikita niyo dun sa literature. Okay, so pwede yung ganun. And then, um, Okay, so may binabanggit kayo dito about yun niya, pakiki, pakikisama and pakikipagkapwa. Um, as far as I know kasi, sa literature ng, ng Filipino psychology or psikolohiyang Pilipino, iba yung treatment ng dalawa na yun. Kasi yung pakiki, pakikisama, surface level siya, tapos yung pakikipagkapwa, mas malalim yun. So um, siguro yung pakikisama, mas, tapos diniscuss nyo pa yung pakikisama at saka yung pakikisalamuha in relation ng mga taho vendors dun sa mga Um, doon sa mga customers nila, hindi nyo ba siya nakikita na parang at play din doon sa mga kapwa nila taho vendors? Tapos, di ba sabi ko yung pakikisama surface level siya, tapos yung pakikipagkapwa tao, medyo mas malalim siya. Um, may, may isang case, may isang statement na parang um, may isang pumasok na may isang pumasok na um, taho vendor doon sa area niya, pagkatapos sinabihan niya lang, hayaan niyo na lang siya, may pamilya rin niya na binubuhay, so parang hayaan niyo na lang siya na mag-negosyo, ganyan. So parang hindi ba pakikisama rin yun or pakikipagkapwa tao rin siya? So parang hindi siya, hindi siya gaano nasama doon sa analysis. Tapos, um, uh, wait lang, okay. So, Ayan. So it was also mentioned that some of your participants were employed in the formal sector before uh, bago sila maging taho vendors. Tapos parang meron ba kayong nakitang difference between the narratives of those who were previously employed doon uh, who were previously in, uh, employed in informal in the formal sector pagkatapos doon sa uh, taho vendors sila ever since. Kasi parang baka iba yung iba yung narrative na ma-generate natin kasi parang pinag uh, pinagsama niyo siya in in a in a um in a whole narrative hindi siya ma-distinguish ayun um tapos um okay may nakalagay rin dito na because vendors develop pessimism towards the state ayun binanggit niya siya sa actually sa presentation making them reluctant to participate in social welfare programs as they deserve they turn to their social capitals instead of seeking aid from the government pero ang naalala ko kasi, kasi sa paper niyo binanggit niya yung social capital in relation to their customers na parang uh, binibigyan sila ng gift or ng groceries kapag Pasko or ng pera or hindi sila hindi na kinukuha yung sukli, di ba? Uh, binibigyan na yun sa kanila. Parang doon yung banda na banggit yung yung term na social capital. So, parang parang doon sa doon sa binanggit ko na parang since na hindi silang titiwala sa gobyerno and so and so they turn to their social capitals instead of seeking aid from the government. Parang Paano yun? Paano nagagamit ng mga taho vendors yung mga customers nila para maging social capital? Paparang, paano siya? Um, yung social, paano nyo ba ginagamit yung social capital dito? Parang, is it just a social network? Kasi di ba kay Bordeaux, yung social, yung, yung social networks, yung social capitals um, can be used in, as a resource in, um, in advancing your position in the field. Pagdating naman kay Robert Putnam, mas malawak siya na, na na idea ng social capital kasi network of network of trust and um, network of trust and reciprocity. So parang medyo nalilito lang ako saan saan nang gagaling ibig sabihin ng social capital dito. Ayan, so pakilinaw na lang rin siya. Um, ayan, so ayun lang. So paano siya nagagamit ang social capital? 
um, kapag kakilala ba, social capital na parang ganyan. Then, um, capitalizing on the importance of pakisama. Okay, so nasabi ko na rin ito. So parang asserting that vendors do not, ito yung pinakalast, asserting that vendors do not passively respond to the structures that surround them as a page 30 creates a deeper understanding of this social system as a whole. They are able to negotiate and adapt through their own agency. Hence, also asserting their transformative power and capacity within the state. So parang paano yung, ano ibig sabihin ng transformative power and capacity in society? Ayun. Ayun lang. Thank you. Thank you po, sir. Would the uh, research team want to respond first or should we wait for Dr. Lisa's uh, comments as well? Um, maybe we can... Okay. <laughs> Which one's better? <laughs> Maybe we can move on to Ma'am Liza na rin po. So we can... Sige. Uh, well, first of all, ano, I, I, yun nga, um, I agree with most of the comments of John kasi yun din yung nakita ko in terms of details. But I also want to reiterate uh, yung kong, my congratulations to Pam and Kyla kasi... Uh, well, yung research as it is is well articulated and also yung theoretical, theoretically, uh, yung paper demonstrates naman yung ano, at least uh, a certain level of understanding of structuration theory, which applies well to the study of the whole enterprise. Um, what I appreciate in the paper is it provides us with a lot of insights about the relationship of the whole vendor their customers, the business owner, and the agents of the state. And maraming ano, in other words, and dami, for me, and daming interesting handles that are that can actually be subjected to deeper analysis. Uh, but I think you need to focus on what you want, to, you know, what you want to, to actually harp on. Uh, so having said that, ito yung mga, a little bit of my clarifications. I think in the presentation, in, in, uh, kasi I, I fed back some of them earlier and I think you integrated some of them in your paper already. So, so uh, uh, first of all, it's an introduction. Kasi um, I, I, in the introduction, I thought that you did discuss uh, yung theoretical foundations well. But I was, I was kind of, uh, ano, kasi in, in, in the middle of the introduction, I was actually looking for, ano nga ba yung research issue that he, that you guys want to focus on. So maybe early on, you might want to uh, articulate it na already. Kasi medyo nasa middle na ako ng, ng, ano, ng introduction before. Ay, oo nga pala, ito pala yung research question. So maybe maybe you can put it in a little bit earlier. Uh, uh, yung, my, one of my, ano din, one of my, uh, Observation also is that while you discuss the theoretical foundations relatively more extensively, I was looking more uh, for discussions of the other features of the enterprise itself. Because we discussed the responses, we discussed yung, yung how, how they relate to one another. But I was looking for the description. Siguro maganda dis describe nyo muna ano ba yung Taho enterprise from, from uh, uh, halimbawa, parang a little bit. I, I was looking more a, uh, a bit of parang value chain type of analysis na nag-start siya dito sa ano ng taho, they get this ano, supply, these are, these are the people that they, that, they, ano, that they interact with, and then this is the business owner. So that I can make uh, parang a bit of a mapping of how they are related to one another kasi structuration yung focus nyo eh. So uh, that, that's what I want to, uh, I want to see so that we can further elaborate the structuration process itself as well as the relationships that are formed, maintained, and reproduced. Because uh, it can be better understood if, if I have a, a bigger picture or, or at least the broad picture of what the Taho enterprise really looks like, at least in, in the community. Okay. Uh, and because uh, the gusto I malaman, for example, how do your respondents actually came to be Taho vendors? 
hindi natin na-discussion eh. And how they came to be a part of the Taho business company. Uh, that would uh, that would at least provide me some ano, some insights on papa, ano ba yung mga systems, ano ba yung relationships that are formed, how are they reproduced uh, over time. Diba? Kung eto, naging Taho vendor ako because may encounter to this and then I, I came to be ano, oriented on ito pala yung rules of the game as far as Taho business is concerned. And then it's it's reproduced and reproduced so that we will know the whole enterprise. Uh, second also, yung, uh, diba, kasi magkakaiba yung layer ng kanilang ano, personality dito. Eh. I understand they also reside in the compound. Diba? So that means that uh, aside from being Taho vendors, they're also residents of the compound owned by the business owner, right? At merong, may, may mga sistemang naka-embed doon. Sabi nyo nga yung systems of power and ano. Uh, so, I, I suppose we would be better able to uh, understand it a bit if you can uh, present a little bit of the life histories of the Taho vendor and how how all of these processes uh, possibly uh, ano, parang, are, are they comparable to one another? How do they interact? Uh, and to a certain extent, uh if you uh if you put it there and then also try to elaborate on how the factory was set up maybe we can have a better understanding of their relationship of uh, the relationship of the taho vendor and the business owner kasi uh kasi magandang tingnan yung oy hindi lang siya business owner siya pa rin yung kanilang landlord okay and i don't think uh, while it's true possibly that it's because uh he because of ano because of uh, he has a good intention of providing for the taho vendor i'm pretty sure there's a power relations embedded there <laughs> so uh, kasi parang feeling ko uh, hinahanap ko rin yung ano eh, yung paano ba yung how power actually uh, becomes ano structured within that context and it's not only ano kasi yung being being a resident in the area and also a taho vendor that gets their supply from the taho business there must be something there that can that ano that needs to be explained okay uh so uh again yung uh, possibly complementing it with uh the discussion of the business arrangement between the taho vendor and uh the businessman for example uh Kasi parang uh, while you're saying that they accompany them in, 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 ano, in buying supplies, I didn't, I was trying to look at how, what do they buy ba in the business? Do they buy taho, cook taho in bulk? Or are they employed by, uh, ano, parang ganun, di ba, consignment siya. Pero paano yung arrangement nila? Hatian ba sila? Porsyentohan ba? Or what? Okay, and how are the payments done? Uh, I think that would be, ano, that would make me, again, sabi nga na, appreciate your social relationship that they build if I know this. The same thing with, ano, the same thing with the relationship between the taho vendor and the suke. Diba? Kasi sabi nyo, it grew uh, over the years. I would have, uh, while sinabi nyo kasi, ay, kasi itong mga bata to has already been there, ano, diba? Has already been their customer mula dun sa kanilang family. But uh, some vignettes of how how they're able to ano, gain the trust not uh, initially of the parents and then and then the children. Magandang tingnan yung sa vignettes. Possibly may mga ano dun eh, na it's uh, I think yung yung years of knowing each other would help. But definitely may mga ano may mga incidences don that that kind of ano uh, parang structure the trust that they are able to develop okay so uh so how are they structured and reproduced over time in other words social capital does not simply just uh no, happen overnight diba? and structured overnight it may may, may history yan, may mga context yan that happened so uh intergenerationally how did it happen parang maganda yata tingnan at makukuha natin yun dun sa life stories kaya gusto ko sana yung life history a bit uh, and then the same thing apply with ano, agents of state. Tama si John. Uh, while you're talking about uh, ano, about relationship with the state, 
I I am actually looking for some transactions that the vendors have with the government. Parang hindi yata yun na discuss ng ano. Uh, so that uh, again, um, some some accounts of that would tell us whether there are relationship or non-relationship between the state and the Taho vendor. Baka naman wala talaga sila encounter with the state. ba? Diba? Kasi baka hindi naman sila nagbabayad kasi ng tax. So baka wala. Or baka meron kasi yung mga police na, na hinuhuli sila pag nandyan. So yung mga ganun, baka kailangan ilabas natin yan. Because it, it actually also, yung mga ganun incidences can actually present some occasions for structurations. Okay. So yun. Mas pinocus ko sa structuration actually and the interaction between those the dynamics of what's happening. But again, kanina sinabi rin ni John, maybe you should look into yung Bordeaux's notion ng social capital. Ako naman, I was actually looking at maybe you can also discuss or put in yung ano notion ng habitus. The habitus being ano uh, yung yung ano that they live in the same compound, they navigate to the same streets. They probably have developed similar patterns of survival, mga ethical practices, or relating with one another for that matter. Again, pointing out to how structured. Okay. And then, uh, again, uh, parang siguro just to strengthen yung, 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 uh, ano, yung, yung paper, uh, if it's possible also to, ano, to compare it with the experiences of uh, some informal sectors in other places because there might be comparisons also. Kasi vendors to eh. So they probably share the same experiences so that you can you can actually you know, discuss uh, the street as, as an ano, diba? as, as, a, as a venue wherein these kinds of uh, systems can develop. And lastly, of course, uh, yun nga, maybe you can also cite a little bit and elaborate more on the limitations that you encountered by using qualitative research in the context of the pandemic. Because I'm sure all of this information you will be able to gather if you have more time actually to, ano, to interact with them or incidences to interact with them. But again, as an, as an undergraduate paper, I thought that it, uh, well, it meets the requirements of an undergraduate paper. So, congratulations. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Lim and Mr. Abletics. Um, if members of the research team would like to respond to some of the comments. Um, thank you so much for those comments. But we'll apply them in our um, final manuscript. Um. <laughs> I guess uh, just to address some of the questions po, uh, the state po kasi when we were writing this paper, we uh, the, the perception that Pam and I had was the other um, actors that are but, uh, uh, that are also interplaying with the process. So yung um, mga vulnerabilities po nila and also yung mga relationships nila with like authorities, not exactly like um, formal authorities, pero yung kunya yung mga guard po sa mga subdivision na hindi sila pinapapasok. So, uh, yun po yung uh, idea namin of the state. Maybe that's where the um, confusion came from. But um, we will surely address this po in our paper. Yung mga guards, I think, are authorities of power. So, maybe you can simply just encounter with authorities of power. Yes. <laughs> Pero tama na siya naman for... yung ano, maganda sana ang i-include yung, for example, encounter nila sa police, sa barangay tanod, yung mga ganun. Kasi mga ano yan eh, representatives of the state yun at the local level eh. Mm -hmm. Parang yun nga, parang nung nakita ko yung state, ano, vendor-state relationship yun nga, I was, I was expecting na, ah, siguro ito na yung ano, ito na yung medyo madugol klase ng ano, pero ayun. So yun, naghanap tayo ng ganun. Yes, Pam, you were saying? Oh, uh, for most of Ma'am Lai's comments, so we actually included that in the first draft of our manuscript, but we had to cut down because of the word count. So um, just to address mm -hmm. them, uh, most of the vendors, uh, they came to the factory because they um, worked in the, um, the, the factory that closed down initially. Um, so they were in the factory. 
or they were uh, referred by their family, so by their dad or by their uncles or by their um, in-laws. So um, established with talaga dun yung like interconnections nila and how important that is in the relationships dun sa enterprise. And then also um, they are consignees, but they only buy the raw materials of that of the house, so like um, soybeans and sugar. Tapos um, every four to six p.m. they line up to uh, pay for those um, ingredients, and then 60-70 p.m. start of um, the Boiling of water, 7.30 to 9 p.m. cooking of sago, 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. is the cooking of sago, which reaches, which reaches up to six batches. And then 7 a.m. to 12 p.m. is the time that they pedal to sila in the street. And then 12 to 4 p.m. is when they rest and come home. And then ayun, that's their routine every day. I was just, ano, actually, sorry, baka overtime na tayo. But <laughs> yung, yung curious lang kasi ako eh. Like, for example, uh, What's in it in there for the business aside from ano aside from uh yung nga kasi di ba inaallow niya to stay there di ba I, I think renter sila are they renter there or, or what so yung yung ganung tipo kaya, kaya medyo gusto ko maala, maintindihan kasi yung dynamics of relationship and how it's you know, again how it's structured so, kasi parang, uh, although I would tend to think, sabi nyo nga more of, ano, more of uh, parang kindness that he allowed them in. Pero, pero bakit? <laughs> I guess, yun yung nag sa isip ko, bakit? What's in it for him? Kasi siyempre business to eh, and I assume that he, he also would want to earn something. So, and I want to understand because maybe some, there's something there that we can we can build on in terms of assisting our vendors and the whole um, I think Dr. Rosales sent me a long message. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Rosales. We'll, sh- we'll share our final paper to you, Rin. All right. Uh, I guess uh, we have taken note of uh, the comments from our reviewers for points of revision. Again, we would like to thank our reviewers, uh, Dr. Lisa Lim and Mr. John Abletis for their comments. And also, we would like to congratulate the research team for their successful presentation. Now we will proceed with the closing of today's program. Um, we would like to call on to the stage Dr. Enrique Nino Leviste, Associate Professor of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology and Director of the Institute of Philippine Culture for his closing remarks. Uh, thank you, Cherry. Uh, first of all, no, I would like to thank everyone who made this uh, third undergraduate student research conference or colloquium a success despite you know uh, the limited face-to-face contact that we still operate in on campus so uh, from the organizers no sina cherry sina kaloy sina katrine and uh, well the department of sociology and anthropology who actually gave us the go signal to proceed no on site you know, with this activity, with this annual activity. It is really a breath of fresh air for us to see one another on site, even though hindi pa siya fully on site, but to see people and to actually clap our hands after every presentation, actually clapping our hands, not virtually, you no, know, is actually liberating and a welcome development. Uh, the theme of uh, this year's um, Colloquium or conference is um, identities, institutions, and inequalities. But it could very well be about agency as well. So, siguro yun yung hindi na isama. Hindi, no, and hindsight is always 2020. Hindi na isama or hindi na articulate yung tao. And I think the success of this um, conference is all about. Uh, the willingness of different actors you know, to collaborate with one another and to make possible an event like this in such a landscape that is still full of disruption. And I think that shows us our capacity to innovate, to adapt, and to adjust. 
And so we celebrate, you know, apart from the institutions that we operate in, we more importantly celebrate you know, through this conference uh, the creativity and the willingness of actors, of agents, you know, of social agents to work together. And so again, on behalf of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, uh, we thank each and every one of you for your contributions, for the students who spent sleepless nights, I reckon, no, on these commendable manuscripts and papers. We learned a lot from them, from the supervisors who one way or another have been uh, their North Star no, no, in terms of guidance, in terms of moral support and whatnot. No? So again, thank you very much and hope to see you next year fully on-site. No? And congratulations to those who are graduating this August. Good night, everyone. Muli, maraming salamat po sa mga kasama natin sa Zoom, sa back-end po ng DSA, Edo, Katrin, Kaloy, and syempre si Ma'am Burns na lagi pong nakagabay at antabay. Maraming salamat po sa ating lahat. To the students, congratulations. To the advisors, salamat po ulit. And reviewers, magandang gabi.